A terrified man huddles in the corner, heart pounding and teeth chattering. He sees them coming towards him, huge eight-legged figures, ten feet tall at least, with eight black soulless eyes that seem to stare hungrily at him. It's like something out of a nightmare, giant man-eating spiders everywhere. They approach the man, fangs dripping with venom, but just as they're about to strike, he vanishes. He won't be spider food today, but for this truly unlucky guy, his ordeal is far from over. Let's rewind. When life gets a little too boring, we all daydream about getting away. Maybe you imagine sitting on a tropical beach, or camping in the mountains and breathing in the fresh air. Some of the more adventurous types with a vivid imagination might daydream about visiting a parallel universe. Who wouldn't want the chance to see what life is like in another dimension? Of course, it would only be fun to go there if you could control where you went and when you could come back. Without any control over it, the ability to hop back and forth between dimensions would turn from a blessing to a curse. Just ask SCP-507. SCP-507, unlike most other SCPs, is a seemingly normal human man. He has blonde hair, green eyes, an unrecognizable accent and no other features that might make him stand out. He looks perfectly average, like a stranger you'd pass on the street and never give a second thought to. What sets him apart is not a physical attribute, but rather an ability that he has yet to develop a firm grasp on. He is a dimension hopper, with no control over where he goes or when he'll get back. After appearing on the grounds of a mental treatment facility with no identification, rambling about a world of giant spiders, SCP-507 was admitted to the hospital and sedated for his own safety. He would spend several months in treatment for a variety of supposed disorders, but once he became aware of his surroundings, he attempted to escape the hospital multiple times. During these escape attempts, he often eluded hospital staff by mysteriously disappearing and reappearing in seemingly impossible places, such as behind locked doors or in rooms blocked off from the rest of the hospital. These disappearances and reappearances seemed to be, contrary to what the hospital staff first believed, beyond his control. The SCP Foundation became aware of the strange phenomena surrounding 507, and he was removed from the hospital and brought to an SCP Foundation facility. Once there, the nature of his abilities became much clearer. SCP-507 is able to, without intent or even knowledge that it is about to occur, shift from this reality to another alternate reality. After some time there, with the amount of time varying from case to case, he will shift back to this reality. He has been known to shift realities while sleeping, in the middle of a sentence, and even while bathing or going to the bathroom. The shifts are unpredictable, and there is no telling what kind of horrors he will encounter in the new dimension where he ends up, leading to 507 having seen some very strange things, even by SCP Foundation standards. During one of his shifts, 507 found himself in a pitch black room filled with the sound of muted breathing. Using a flashlight he had been given by the Foundation, he looked around and found that he was not alone. In the room with him was a man, wearing a black suit and sunglasses, with a frightening, inhumanly wide smile. The smiling man leaned in towards 507 so close that their faces nearly touched and said, Back so soon. Terrified, 507 fired several rounds from a Foundation-issued pistol, then curled up in the corner of the room until he shifted back to our reality. This would not be the last time that he encountered the Smiling Man. According to Document 507-3B, which details all of 507 shifts into other realities. 507 was found in a Midwestern cornfield by Foundation staff with brown liquid on his cheek. In his hand, he held a human heart with the words, I need you, written on it in the same brown liquid. Before he shifted back and landed in the cornfield, 507 shifted to a pitch black room filled with the sound of muffled crying. He turned on his flashlight, taking note of his surroundings, and found himself face to face with the Smiling Man once again. The Smiling Man had brown liquid leaking from around its sunglasses, which it wiped onto 507's cheek. Upon further examination, 
507 saw several bullet holes in the smiling man's suit, leaking the same brown liquid. He attempted to fire his pistol like he had the previous time, but it did not fire. As the smiling man began to approach him, 507 turned and ran. He ran for about 10 minutes before finding a corner where he stayed huddled once again until he shifted back. The Smiling Man is not the only nightmare that SCP-507 has encountered on his travels. During another shift, 507 described appearing in a small room filled with dried corpses, a single window, and a flickering light hanging from a ceiling. While attempting to wait out his time in the room, he discovered that the corpses were capable of movement. Whenever the room was in darkness, the corpses would pose themselves like living people. When he looked out the window, the corpses would join him and look out the window with him. When he sat down, they would sit with him in a circle. 507 attempted to pass time by falling asleep, but was unable to do so. Though many of his experiences were disturbing, only one of 507's documented shifts resulted in him requesting a memory wipe from the SCP Foundation. On this one, he found himself in the maternity wing of a large hospital. A creature, dressed like a nurse, approached 507 and told him that he was upsetting the other patients and that it was time to start the operation. 507 was then wrapped in a straitjacket and wheeled into an operating room. After the straitjacket was taken off, 507 grabbed a chair and swung it wildly at the creatures to keep them at bay until he shifted back. When he asked to describe the appearance of the nurse creature, 507 began screaming in terror and was unable to provide a coherent description. He attempted to provide a drawing of the creature, but was only able to produce a series of jagged lines. Following this encounter, his request for a memory wipe was denied. Other shifts included going to a world where every surface was covered with an unidentifiable mold, a land of icy tundras populated by aggressive bears, and one place that he refused to describe beyond repeating the phrase, so many spiders. Not all of the worlds that 507 has encountered are frightening. Some are simply strange and unusual. During one shift, he found himself on a large basketball court, where six other individuals were playing a game of basketball. There were two humans, two insectoid creatures, one creature resembling a squid, and one hovering yellow sphere with eight arms. When 507 asked where he was, he was informed that he had arrived at the All Species Sports Center. During another shift, 507 found himself in a world made entirely of gelatin. During yet another shift, he appeared in a large auditorium filled with 50,000 other dimension hoppers who were holding a political rally for the People's Dimension Hopper Republic. Working with the Republic over the course of two weeks, 507 helped to overthrow the United States government and establish a new one run by Dimension Hoppers. SCP-507 was elected representative of Massachusetts, but just before he could introduce his first official piece of legislation, he shifted back to our reality. One day at the facility, a particularly unusual event involving SCP-507 occurred, the events of which were documented in Interview 507-G. During a regular check-in, it was discovered that there were somehow two identical versions of SCP-507 in its room. They had apparently each arrived in the room independently and had been talking to one another for about half an hour before being discovered. These two versions were referred to as 507-A and 507-B. When prompted for an explanation, 507-B explained that there were more than one version of SCP-507 afflicted with uncontrollable dimension hopping. The doctor inquired as to which one of the two was the visitor, but the two declined to answer, fearing that this knowledge would cause the Foundation to view one of them as expendable. The two had multiple shared experiences that they related to the doctor, including both having encounters with the smiling man. During the interview, 507-B disappeared mid-sentence and did not reappear. The doctor asked 507-A about identifiable differences between his and his double's realities. 507-A explained that in 507-B's world, President Lincoln was killed by his vice president, whereas in 507-A's world, he was killed by General Lee. This revelation made it clear that neither 507-A nor 507-B were native to this reality. After this was revealed, 
507-A was terminated and examined. No biological reason for 507's ability to hop from dimension to dimension was found, though it was discovered that several pieces of 507 will shift dimensions along with the rest of the body. Three days after this interview was conducted, the correct SCP-507 reappeared, with no knowledge of his doppelgangers or what became of them. SCP-507 is classified as safe, meaning he doesn't require any real effort to contain. He's also safe in the more literal sense, in that he poses no threat to anyone else. The only person in danger in the presence of SCP-507 is himself, as he has been exposed to many dangerous conditions during his reality shifts, and it's never known whether 507's next shift will end up being his last. With the cause of his shift still being unknown, there is nothing that the Foundation can do to prevent them. All they can do is monitor him, and provide him with the items that might ensure his safety in the future. Like a handgun loaded with rubber bullets, a tank of air, a high-intensity flashlight, a week of ration packs, a pair of binoculars, a tracking collar, and a camera. The tracking collar allows the Foundation to recover 507 when he shifts back to our reality, in a location other than the containment facility. The rest of the equipment was granted at his request, based on obstacles that he encountered in other dimensions. Due to his docile nature, 507 is given freedom to move about the facility, but when he leaves his private room, an agent must go with him to document any shifts that might occur. No one is allowed to touch SCP-507, though, if it has been more than two weeks since a shift occurred. This policy stems from an incident in which an agent who was touching 507's shoulder at the time of a shift was taken with him and did not return. When he is not shifting, SCP-507 lives a relatively normal life at the facility. He is allowed his own computer with internet access and can meet with other safe or Euclid-class SCPs that are not infectious or detrimental to his health. 507 has expressed an interest in the unusual and paranormal, and has enjoyed meeting with other SCPs, including a request to visit SCP-082 for a vacation. So far, all of these meetings have occurred without incident. Due to his anomalous shifting, SCP-507 will never be able to live a normal life. Unless he stops shifting, he will likely spend the rest of his days bouncing between unknown dimensions and his containment facility. Just like so much else about him, his relationship to his special talent is a bit of a paradox. He has the ability to go anywhere, to see things no other person on Earth has ever seen. However, because he cannot control it, cannot stop it, no matter how far away he can travel, he will never truly be free. Over 50 men and women, clad in red robes, kneel before an unholy altar. They chant and mutter indecipherable words, words of cruelty and madness, of obsession and sacrilege. Not long ago, these were regular people, computer technicians, teachers, plumbers, construction workers, accountants. This was before they fell under the ungodly influence of a new ruler. The center of this makeshift place of worship was once a normal school gymnasium, but it's now the home of a huge statue. A humanoid being, wreathed in tentacles, its head is more like a squid or cuttlefish than anything resembling an actual human face. While he's known to the cultists as the Tentacled God, the beast they worship is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-2662 and he sits in the belly of one of their expansive containment facilities, locked away from the world. But not for long, if his devoted followers have anything to say about it. This is their god, all-powerful and unchanging, and when it comes to springing him from containment, no tactic is too vile or underhanded to get the job done. Their mortal leader and high priest, a man in a purple robe calling himself Brother Marsh, walks among their crouched forms. He whispers instructions for the great day of liberation that's soon to come, providing everyone plays their part. It's a plan months in the making, and one that, if it goes off without a hitch, could free their monstrous god into the world. They would strike at the very heart of their enemy, the SCP Foundation, when they least expect it, and nothing shall stand in their way.
How could they lose when they have a god on their side? But why did all these normal people become violent zealots for a squid-faced deity? It all began with a dream. To those who experienced these dreams, they felt more like prophecies, premonitions of the glorious horrors to come. A red sky, billions dead, and billions more enslaved, a dark silhouette on the horizon, their tentacled god holding dominion over all. At first, it just seemed like a strange nightmare. The ones who experienced it woke up shaken and afraid, hoping to shake the images from their mind, but they couldn't. Every night, the nightmare would return. They'd see the images, the red sky, the dead and enslaved, the tentacled god. And after a while, it would come to them even when they weren't asleep, eventually happening whenever they closed their eyes. Little by little, this scene stopped looking so hideous and started to look glorious. They felt his presence in their minds, slowly pushing them towards their inevitable future. They started to realize that they wanted him to rule over the universe and to experience the honor of serving him. Many of them abandoned their homes and families, leaving their friends and loved ones left to worry that they'd gone insane. In their eyes, they were safer than they'd ever been. They finally had purpose. They were working in service of something far greater than themselves. The influence of the tentacled god drew them closer to one another. They would meet in secret, exchanging information from the prophecies their ruler sent to them in their dreams. They worshipped together, building altars and idols to congregate around. They performed dark blood rituals involving human and animal sacrifice. It was when Brother Marsh, the Anointed One, arrived to guide them towards their true mission that things kicked into high gear. Just three months prior, Brother Marsh had been an office drone working in data entry for a large insurance company before the tentacled god invaded his thoughts with a simple message. Free me, and the new world I create shall be your playground. Since then, he devoted himself completely to the cause quitting his job and maxing out his credit cards to help fund his new life's purpose, infiltrating the SCP Foundation and releasing his inhuman ruler from its imprisonment. That was the single goal he united the cultists under, freedom for the tentacled god. And at long last, they had all the pieces in place to strike. They'd finally gathered the necessary intel to subvert the will of the most powerful secret organization on Earth. Even the strongest institution is made of people, and people are weak. Unlike the almighty tentacled god, people could be broken. The people in question were Kelly Thompson, Sidney Levitt, Jordan Broche, Dr. Juan Gutierrez, and Jillian Larson. Dr. Juan Gutierrez was a researcher with level 3 clearance on the site where the tentacled god was being contained. Sidney Levitt and Jordan Broche were both security officers charged with verifying personnel clearance on site. Kelly Thompson was a member of Site Administration with Research Authorization Powers, and Jillian Larson was a research assistant who often collaborated with Dr. Gutierrez. These five were the key to getting access to SCP-2662 and bringing their plan to fruition. Normally, personnel dossiers on people working for the Foundation were highly confidential, but the devotees of the tentacled god had their ways. They had a number of computer experts in their ranks, more than capable of hacking in and pulling some basic information off of Foundation servers without being detected. For the other information they needed, they turned to some good old-fashioned torture, which is often the most effective method when you need some quick results. Of course, while the cult's grip on sanity may have been a little tenuous, they weren't stupid. While gathering their intel, they also made sure to find out what exactly they were up against. SCP-2662 was being held in a humanoid containment cell and guarded by on-site Task Force Tau-9, better known as the Belligerent Bodyguards. These aren't lazy, donut-chomping mall cops. These are a heavily trained, heavily armed fighting force. Though the cultists had one thing that these Foundation soldiers didn't, the element of surprise. For everything to go off perfectly, Brother Marsh's plans would have to be executed within a single day, and they were already on the clock. Tau-9 had been charged with tracking down any new SCP-2662 cults and dismantling them. 
and Brother Marsh knew that it was only a matter of time before the Foundation tracked them down and did the same to them. If they wanted any chance of freeing the Tentacled God, then they'd need to strike quickly and with overwhelming force. The SCP-2662 worshippers were able to secure the addresses of the five key Foundation personnel and station members outside each of them, including one who could realistically imitate each. They waited for night to fall and broke into each of their homes as they slept. What followed was a sequence of ruthless and efficient murders done in the cause of freeing their god. Dr. Gutierrez was shot in the head while he slept. Sidney Levitt and Jordan Broche were both stabbed to death before either even realized what was happening. Thompson, who'd gotten up to use the bathroom, went down in a hail of machine gun fire. Jillian Larson had seen that masked figures were breaking into her home and attempted to flee, but was caught and beaten to death by cultists in her hallway. It was a strange irony that people whose day jobs entailed working with some of the most dangerous and nightmarish anomalies imaginable were murdered in their homes by nothing more than regular humans. So far, Brother Marsh's plan had gone perfectly, with all five key personnel murdered within a two-minute period. Next, the selected doppelgangers stole clothes from their victims' closets and were handed the correct forged documentation. The next morning, each replacement began their journeys to the site where the tentacled god was being contained, while the rest of the cult armed themselves in preparation for their own part in the plan. Nobody at the Foundation seemed to notice anything amiss when the five arrived on site. When you work for the SCP Foundation, more mental energy is devoted to following the rules that keep you alive than to memorizing the faces of all your co-workers, and each one slipped neatly into position disappearing into the familiarity of office life. But infiltrating the site was one thing. Getting past the belligerent bodyguards and into the cell of the tentacled god would be another thing entirely. That's where the rest of the cult would come into play. Heavily armed with whatever firearms they could get their hands on, the rest of the devotees of the tentacled god, Brother Marsh included, would attack the containment site head on. In the ensuing chaos, the five cultists who had already infiltrated the site could take advantage of the distraction and break into the containment chamber. It was perfect. They launched their attack from the outside and from within. When Brother Marsh declared that the time was right, the assault began. A legion of gun-wielding cultists seemed to spring out of nowhere and started shooting up the warehouse that was a front for the containment site. The site quickly mobilized guards and task force members to take on the sudden threat, and just as Brother Marsh had anticipated, the site director called on the majority of Tau-9 to help repel the violent cultists from their perimeter. Tau-9 obeyed, leaving three task force members behind to guard SCP-2662's containment chamber. They expected to be guarding the cell from rampaging religious zealots seeking an audience with their god. What they didn't expect was a group of five Foundation employees walking right up to them and opening fire, killing two Tau-9 members and taking the third as hostage. While the war was being waged outside, the infiltrators had found the Tentacle God's containment cell in the low-risk humanoid ward. Their hostage insisted that using him wouldn't give them any leverage. The rest of his team would neutralize the whole group, him included, if that's what it took to stop them. The infiltrators explained that using him as leverage was never their intention. He wasn't a hostage at all. He was a sacrifice. The cultists of the tentacled god detonated explosives, creating a hole in the wall and finally giving them access to their deity. They climbed through and gazed upon him in awe. There stood SCP-2662, twice as tall as a regular man, with ten huge tentacles emerging from its back. In their months of envisioning this creature, they'd pictured it sitting on a throne made of thousands of human bones, ready to dictate its commands to the obedient liberators. What they certainly didn't expect was to see the tentacled god hunched over a computer screen. Still, gods work in mysterious ways. So they stuck to the plan and began chanting. They pulled out a sacrificial dagger and began sacrificing their captured Tau-9 member. It was at this point that SCP-2662 turned and saw what they were doing with a look of pure horror. He rose up from his computer, his headphones getting caught as he did so. He told them to go away, that he didn't want them here, and that them murdering people in his bedroom like this was inconsiderate and disgusting. 
the cultists became even more confused. Why wasn't their god accepting their offerings? What were they doing wrong? They tried more chanting and painting arcane symbols on the floor in blood, but this just seemed to make the creature angrier. He told them, in a tone more fitting for a teenage boy than a Lovecraftian god, to just leave him alone so he could play his video games. This was seriously not cool. The cultists were baffled. They told the tentacled god that they were there to free him. He replied that he didn't need saving, that crazy stalkers like them were why he turned himself into the Foundation in the first place. Before the cultist infiltrators could get another word in, the remaining members of Tau-9 stormed into the containment cell and gunned them down with surgical precision. The war outside was already over. Brother Marsh and the rest of the cultists were all killed in the firefight. Tau-9 didn't look the least bit surprised upon entering 2662's cell. This was a common occurrence, unfortunately. They had to deal with an attempted cult invasion every few months, because SCP-2662's main anomalous ability is inspiring violent cults who relentlessly track down and worship it with arcane and bloodthirsty rituals. The problem is, 2662 doesn't do this consciously, and definitely doesn't like the results. That's why he's under the voluntary care of the SCP Foundation, who keeps him amused with video games and reading material, while fending off the deranged cults who try to invade and abduct him. Following the termination of the devotees of the tentacled god, just one of many cults who'd broken into 2662's containment cell, the remaining Tau-9 members apologized to the tentacled creature for the disturbance, allowing him to return to his gaming. They assured him that it'd probably be at least a few more months before something like this happened again. SCP-2662's cell was repaired, and the Foundation returned to its task of seeking out would-be cult emancipators, because for the SCP Foundation, it's not always about the anomaly that's being kept in containment, but what's being kept out. Reality Warpers Real pieces of work, aren't they? It's one thing when an anomaly is all claws and fangs like SCP-682, or if their attack of choice is snapping necks like SCP-173. But it is an entirely different story if an anomaly can turn the air you breathe into chocolate pudding, or shove you into a pocket dimension that looks almost like our own reality, except everyone is just a walking, talking pile of spiders. See what I mean? Reality warpers. Real handfuls. Though, of course, not all reality warpers are created equal. Some are relatively weak, only affecting the world around them in a mild, ambient fashion. Others can rattle whole dimensions with their tremendous power. The same also goes for morality. Some reality warpers are loving and benevolent, such as SCP-343, the kindly, old, all-powerful being known to some as God. And some are pure evil beings who want nothing more than to use their immense power to sow chaos and misery among everyone else. And personally, we can't think of a better example of the latter than Bill Cipher from Gravity Falls. This demonic Dorito wants nothing more than to take over our dimension and rebuild it in his image of absolute insanity. So naturally, we started wondering, if these two reality warping titans, SCP-343 and Bill Cipher, ever came to blows, who would win? We were so curious, in fact, that we fired up the Anomatron 6000 our state-of-the-art simulation supercomputer to see how exactly the two might meet and how their epic battle would play out. Who do you think would take the coveted W on this one? Let us know down in the comments, along with any other out-of-universe what-if situations you'd love to see. But in the meantime, let's fire up the machine. Be warned, folks, it's gonna get weird. The date was July 12th, 2013. For SCP-343, it had started out as a relatively normal day. He'd spent the night playing solitaire on the astral plane before warping back into his humanoid containment cell by morning, leaving the Foundation none the wiser. After all, he was really here voluntarily. If the Foundation had truly wanted to try to confine him here, they were welcome to give it a go, but it would be about as effective as trying to catch a whisper in a butterfly net. While God had come to this place to experience the joyful illusion of giving up control, it truly was little more than an illusion to him. If he wanted to, he could exterminate the SCP Foundation in less than an afternoon, then retire to Burger King for a Whopper. So really, they're all just lucky he is a benevolent being, more interested in hanging out than dispensing wrath on those he perceived as insolent. 
That was Old Testament him. He'd done a lot of soul searching and growth since then. It'd been at least a millennium since he'd smote anyone for that matter, and the last guy really had it coming. However, today was going to be a little different. God knew that something was going to happen today. He sensed a great source of energy emerging, something dark and malevolent. He sighed and he closed his eyes for a moment, focusing himself. He knew whatever the nature of this threat, it would fall upon him to face and destroy it. How irritating. He was hoping to finally binge Stranger Things today. Elsewhere in Site-19, things seemed to be inordinately peaceful. There hadn't been any containment breaches or new anomalies brought in. There hadn't been any attacks from rival groups of interest. Dr. Bright hadn't even done anything stupid or started any fires. To borrow an old cliché, it was quiet, too quiet. Perhaps the only person who wasn't having a relatively mellow day was Security Officer Frederick Simmons, a mid-level guard who'd been stationed at Site-19 for four years now. He just wasn't really feeling himself today. The work didn't bother Simmons, emotionally at least. Typically, even after seeing rather traumatic things or being in near-death situations while in containment breaches, it hadn't left any lingering effects. But lately, he'd been having the strangest dreams. It always played out the same way. Shortly after going to sleep, he'd open his eyes in a strange multicolored void surrounded by bizarre, seemingly random floating objects, none of which seemed to have any real relevance to him or his life. And just when he'd begin to question it, the other recurring element of the dream would occur. Out of the shimmering oil slick rainbow of mind-boggling colors, a strange being would suddenly emerge. A glowing golden triangle, almost like a drawing of a pyramid, the eye of providence, with a stovepipe hat, a little bow tie, thin black arms and legs, and most notable of all, a single large eye with a slit pupil staring out from the center. The eye almost seemed to have a strange hypnotic quality to it. Simmons felt bewitched whenever he looked into it. He wasn't afraid, quite the opposite actually. For reasons he couldn't understand, this strange creature from the world of dreams seemed like a good friend of his. He said, Well, 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 if it isn't my number one guy, the Fredmeister, in the house. I've missed you. Have you missed me? Put her there, good buddy. The entity extended his hand and Simmons shook it. The Foundation Guard could feel a strange tingling sensation jolting down his arm. The first time Simmons had encountered the entity, he'd told him his name, Bill Cipher, and he told him how incredibly important it was that Simmons kept their little nighttime meetings a secret. In exchange, Bill was here to listen. Simmons would spend his time in the mindscape pouring out his worries and frustrations with his daily work, as Bill paid impeccable attention. The strange little dream entities seemed fascinated by the work Simmons did, all the peculiar and wondrous anomalies he guarded at Site-19. But to Simmons, it was all just boring work. Zombie creating supernatural plague doctors and immortal men with metal limbs lose their shine after you see them day in, day out, for years on end. Frankly, Simmons needed a day off, but he'd already used up all his PTO when he'd gotten the flu earlier that year. He just didn't know what to do. Luckily for him, Bill had a solution. Bill, as it turned out, had a fancy little ability. He could occupy the body of a human being and operate it for them. Bill could take the wheel while Simmons took a load off in the mindscape. How hard could standing around pretending to look busy at the SCP Foundation really be? As Bill explained the offer to him, Simmons couldn't really see any flaws in his reasoning. After all, Bill was a friend. Why would he have any ill will towards him? With that, he shook hands with the bizarre supernatural triangle and felt the sudden, rough sensation of having his consciousness ripped from his body, only for Bill to slither in and take his place. The new Simmons, the Bill-occupied Simmons, opened up his demonic yellow eyes and grinned. He gave a demented laugh to Simmons' floated, disembodied soul. <laughs> oh, man! He said, wiping away a tear of laughter with Simmons' finger. With your body, I can use the SCP Foundation's technology to take over the multiverse! See ya, sucker! And with one last demented chuckle, Bill left for work at the SCP Foundation, with Simmons being the latest in his long line of meat puppets. After arriving at Site-19, he sneaked through the facility, knowing exactly where he needed to be. 
You see, Bill is a native entity of the second dimension, the world of flat shapes. But he's able to access the minds of beings in the third dimension, like us, through the medium of the mindscape, rather than the physical realm. Bill's life goal has always been to find a way to permeate and take over the third dimension, turning it into his personal playground. All he needed was the right anomaly to bring him forth into our world. In this case, a little anomalous device favored by Dr. Kane Pathos Crow, SCP-158, also known as the Soul Extractor. While Dr. Crow left to the courtyard for his evening walkies, the being that most people assumed was Fred Simmons secreted himself into SCP-158's containment chamber and locked the door behind him. He didn't have much time. He'd need to do this perfectly if he wanted a real chance at taking over the universe. He was amused by the irony, at the least. The fact that, in order to take over, he needed to sneak into the midst of the people most likely to destroy him. Still, where's the fun in life with no risk? At SCP-158's control console, he inputted the data to soul extraction and set a timer. However, there was one difference between this and the usual procedures performed with the soul extractor. There was no containment receptacle on the other end. Whatever was extracted would just be released into the world. And this was exactly what Bill was counting on. He laid Simmons' body down on the gurney and watched with glee as the robotic arm lowered towards him. It reached into his chest and pulled out the essence of one three-sided threat to reality. Bill Cipher. One quick journey through the bowels of the machine later, the nightmare scenario had come to pass. Bill floated around the room, dragged into physical reality. He let out a long, conceited cackle and spun his cane around. This was going to be fun. Elsewhere in the facility, alarms were going off and guards were deploying. Nobody was meant to be in containment chamber 158, so how was the soul extractor currently operating? This couldn't possibly end well. Bill, on the other end, was having a wonderful time. He was pondering all the different ways he could make the drab clinical corridors of the SCP Foundation into his vision of perfect weirdness. Maybe he'd turn all the researchers into mice and turn Site-19 into a giant maze to run them through. Maybe he'd turn the air into farts and release winged beasts from the Hell Dimension to ravage humanity. Maybe he'd go out into the parking lot and key everyone's cars. Oh, the diabolical possibilities were endless. As he floated out into the hall, his fantasizing was interrupted by a group of Foundation security operatives wielding assault rifles. They entered an attack formation and trained their rifles on him before opening fire. Bill just found himself laughing again. The gunfire just tickled. Wow, you guys are hilarious! Bill said between fits of laughter. But wait, I can think of a better way to make you even funnier. He snapped his fingers and suddenly the guards were transformed. Instead of the serious first line of defense for the SCP Foundation, they were now a gang of literal clowns straight from the circus, holding balloon animals molded into the shapes of assault rifles. They giggled and threw pies at each other. Bill was right. This did make them even funnier, and he was just getting started. Turning this Foundation snooze fest into a party of cosmic proportions, Bill began running a rampage of weirdness across the site. Essentially being the ultimate cosmic troll, he decided he'd simply bother every single anomaly he could with his demonic antics. First, he appeared in SCP-096's chamber and pulled a brown paper bag over his head, with the words, Ugliness Lies Within written on the front, and just for fun, he then teleported the temperamental beast to a nearby Amish community. It quickly became enraged when a gust of wind blew the bag off its head, and a man named Jebediah saw its face. It then killed several others, also named Jebediah, during the rampage. Bill thought it was hilarious. He then released SCP-682 into Site-19, and just to annoy the creature into further violence, he stuck an indestructible party hat on the monster's head. No matter how hard 682 tried, it couldn't remove the party hat. This caused it great frustration, which it took out on any Foundation staff it happened to find in the area. It had fulfilled Bill's expectations wonderfully, but his quest for amusing carnage didn't end there. Next, he went to bother SCP-049 the Plague Doctor, who was in the process of doing surgery on a Foundation-provided dead goat. With a snap of his fingers, Bill transformed the Plague Doctor's surgical tools into colorful Play-Doh cutting tools. 
Needless to say, the supernatural surgeon was less than pleased. He was about as annoyed as Dr. Clef was when Bill turned his favorite shotgun into a bouquet of flowers, then sealed his feet into the floor, or how vexed Dr. Gears was when Bill turned his plain beige necktie into a considerably more loud and colorful tie. People there at the time reported hearing Dr. Gears say, I just don't think that was necessary. Oh, and he also did some more minor acts of malice. He filled the break room with an army of flesh-eating zombies. He made a moat filled with molten lava around the site that prevented anyone from escaping from his reign of terror. And he even covered all the walls in cognito-hazardous doodles that instantly drove any weak-minded human who saw them into complete gibbering madness. It was clear this reality-warping nightmare needed to be stopped before he got bored of playing with his new Foundation toys and decided to go remodel the universe in his own image. Thankfully, there was one anomaly on site who was up to the task. Bill was treating himself to another evil laugh in the Site-19 canteen when something peculiar happened. He looked down to see a man in what looked like a tunic with graying hair and a beard. He walked with a peculiar kind of calmness, his face blank. Why wasn't this guy panicking? Was he stupid? Bill would seemingly need to teach this guy a thing or two about fear. Hey Gramps! Don't know if it's escaped your attention, but I've been giving this place an extreme makeover. Did you forget to put on your glasses this morning or are you just that senile? The stranger remained calm as could be. He replied with a voice that was measured as it was deep. Now, Bill, let's not resort to name-calling. That's just childish, don't you think? Bill's single eye widened at this. Wait, wait, hold up. How did you know my name? Bill asked, irritated. Are you a friend of the Time Baby or something? He floated over and began circling the stranger, hoping to intimidate him. Much to Bill's frustration, it didn't appear to be working. I know lots of things, Bill. Lots of things, the stranger replied. That's my line! Bill screeched, turning red. Who do you think you are? The stranger gave a quiet, reserved chuckle that infuriated Bill. Oh, personally, I just like to think of myself as a humble craftsman, watching his beautiful creation play out, he said. But I suppose some of the people around here like to call me God. Bill didn't like this. This whole universe was going to be his, and he certainly didn't appreciate some insolent old man acting like he ran the roost around here. Bill would give him an education in who was really holding the reins, and it would be the kind of education that left scars, if it left anything at all. He extended his spindly black arms and released bolts of lightning against the stranger, who simply continued to smile as the electricity rippled around him, seemingly causing no effect. Are you done? The stranger asked. Bill laughed, hoping to hide his irritation. I'm just getting started, he bellowed. With a thunderous roar that shook the very foundations of Site-19, Bill began to grow and shift. No longer a silly little triangle, he became a huge red pyramid of pure nightmares, covered in glowing golden arms and teeth, with long black tongues drooping out of each level. It was the most terrifying and demonic form in his entire arsenal, and yet he was astonished to find that the stranger still didn't seem to show any kind of fear. Very impressive, Bill. The stranger said, sounding almost bored. But I think you might be trying a little too hard. Oh, that does it. Bill would simply have to destroy him. It was a matter of pride now. He raised several of his huge golden fists and began pounding down on the comparatively tiny humanoid stranger. It was an assault so powerful that the ground began cracking around their feet, and yet it seemed that with almost no effort, the stranger was able to intercept and block every single blow. Naturally, Bill was infuriated. It was time to finally unleash the full breadth of his power on this beardy wise guy. He launched thunderbolts, fireballs, legions of giant mutant wasps, hailstorms, maelstroms, bubbles of pure madness, snakes made out of barbed wire, and even incredible coarse language. But despite it all, this man, the one who claimed people called him God, was utterly unfazed. You can dish it out, he said. But let's see if you can take it. Bill began to laugh. What the heck's that supposed to mean? You can't- God snapped his fingers, and Bill was gone vanished, and with a flick of his wrist, all the damage and transformations that Bill had performed had disappeared. 
It was as though the demonic triangle had never even been there in the first place. Though Dr. Bright, who was acting site director at the time, had some Scranton reality anchors turned on around the perimeter just to be safe. You can never be too careful with reality warping demons, after all. Later that day, Dr. Bright approached God and asked him what he'd actually done with Bill. God chuckled and replied, For a being of such immense power, he really had a rather childish mindset. So I sealed him away inside a children's cartoon where he couldn't do any further damage. What was the cartoon? Dr. Bright asked. A charming little Disney show called Gravity Falls, God replied. Dr. Blast and his group of researchers stand behind bulletproof viewing glass. They all have very serious looks on their face. That is until the first test begins. On one side of the test room, a Class D subject stands holding a sheet of paper. On the other side sits a bright red tomato on a wooden table. Dr. Blast pushes the intercom button and speaks into the microphone. All right, you may begin. D5041 nods and looks down at the sheet of paper in his hand. He begins to read. Is a hippopotamus a hippopotamus or really just a cool opotamus? Nothing happens. D5041 stands there awkwardly waiting. A man next to Dr. Blast in the observation room snickers. Dr. Blast jerks his head toward the researcher and stares him down. This is not a laughing matter, Blast says. The reprimanded researcher clears his throat and stands up straight. <clears throat> Sorry, sir. Dr. Blast leans over and pushes the microphone button again. Proceed to the next joke, D5041. The man on the other side of the glass nods and pulls a second sheet of paper out from behind the first. What's an archaeologist? Someone whose career is in ruins, says D5041. A moment after he finishes the joke, the ripe red tomato launches itself off the table and flies toward the face of D5041. The tomato is clocked at moving 104 miles per hour. D5041 has no time to move before the tomato slams into his nose, instantly breaking it. The men in the observation room behind the bulletproof glass do their best to hold back their laughter. Dr. Blast grumbles as he jots down notes on his clipboard. It appears that SCP-504 has a certain taste in jokes, he says to the rest of the researchers in the room. This elicits a slight chuckle. This might indicate sapience. I hope not. Clear the room and bring in the next subject. Medical personnel and a team of custodial staff enter the room. The physicians tend to D5041's nose and carry him out. The custodians clean the remnants of the tomato off the floor, walls, and ceiling. They exit, leaving the room completely empty. A moment later, the door opens and another ordinary-looking tomato is brought in and placed on the desk. The SCP agent who brought in the tomato leaves. D5042 enters the room a moment later with a sheet of paper in his hand. He stands on the far side of the room away from the SCP-504 tomato sitting on the table. He nervously brings the paper close to his face to read what's on it. Three tomatoes are walking down the street, D-5042 says with a little shake in his voice. He had seen D-5041 exit the room just before he entered, with blood and tomato paste running down his face. A papa tomato, a mama tomato, and a little baby tomato. Baby tomato starts lagging behind. Papa tomato gets very angry, goes over to the baby tomato and smushes him, and says, catch up. The new SCP-504 tomato immediately goes flying from the table straight toward the joke teller. This time, the tomato is clocked at 264 miles per hour when it slams into the face of D-5042. The impact immediately renders him unconscious. After the first few trials, Dr. Blast decides that it's time to take things up a notch. The Foundation has collected hundreds of SCP-504 tomatoes, so there is no shortage. After the room is cleaned once again, a medical team removes the unconscious Class D personnel who was knocked out by the previous SCP-504 experiment, and they're ready to begin again. This time, there will be terrible consequences for their actions. D-5043 enters the room. The SCP-504 tomato has already been placed on the table. You may begin, Dr. Blast says into the microphone. The Class D personnel reads the joke on the sheet of paper he's holding. So I was going to bed and my brother told me, Good night, don't let the bed bugs stick their proboscis in your skin and suck your blood. D5043 pauses for a beat. Good luck on a healthy dermis, he ends the joke. For two seconds, there's no reaction from SCP-504. Dr. Blast thinks this terrible joke just wasn't one that SCP-504 could understand. Suddenly, there's a loud crack. D5043 falls to the floor. Tomato covers where his face once was. When Dr. Blast and the other researchers go back and slow down the video, they witness the SCP-504 tomato traveling so quickly that it broke the sound barrier. The tomato impacted the joke teller at an unfathomable speed, instantly killing him. Dr. Blast decides that he needs to be more careful when choosing jokes for the safety of everyone involved. Perhaps a crossbreed between SCP-504 and regular tomatoes will yield different results. 
After the unfortunate death of D5043, the research team waits a few days before experimenting with new strains of SCP-504. Three different crossbreeds are brought into the room and placed equidistant from each other on the table. D5044 enters the room. Dr. Blast presses the intercom button and orders him to begin. If you have dentures, don't use artificial sweetener because you'll get a fake cavity, says D5044. The moment the joke ends, all three tomatoes launch toward him at 145 miles per hour. They hit him square in the face, two teeth are dislodged, and the test subject is covered in the remains of the three squashed tomatoes. Interesting, notes Dr. Blast. All the tomatoes reacted in the same way. So now we know multiple instances of SCP-504 will go after the same joke maker. He pauses to think for a moment. What if we cut up the tomatoes? The test room is reset. Another SCP-504 tomato is brought in and cut up into quarters. D-5045 enters the room and begins his joke. I tried to walk into a target, but I missed. All four pieces of the tomato speed toward D-5045's face. They slam into him at 212 miles per hour. One of the pieces of tomatoes impales itself into his eye, instantly destroying it. The medical team rushes in and removes the howling subject from the room. Dr. Blast writes vigorously on his clipboard. We are starting to go through test subjects too quickly, he announces. Let's try a recording and see if SCP-504 will react to that. The research team brings in a new tomato, a CD player, and the Harmful If Swallowed album by Dane Cook. The CD begins to play. During one of the jokes, the tomato launches itself off the table and slams into the CD player, causing both the stereo and the tomato to shatter into several pieces. The tomato was clocked at 167 miles per hour. It would appear that SCP-504 reacts to the recordings as well. We didn't even have to deal with the damn Class Ds in the first place, says Dr. Blast. He informs his team that since the risk level is now relatively low, they can continue the experiments without him. He leaves the observation room to get some rest. The other researchers look at one another, mischievous smiles crossing their faces as they begin to laugh. The SCP-504 research team sets up three new tomatoes and brings three Class D subjects into the room. The researchers then retreat back into the observation area and begin a joke over the intercom system while the Class D personnel wait patiently in the room with the SCP-504 tomatoes. The following news item has just been released, said one of the researchers over the intercom. Bomb blows hole in Lennon statue. The first test subject finishes the joke with the ending written on his sheet of paper. Ooh, that's gonna leave a marks. Test subject one says, the first tomato twitches but does not leave its location on the table. The second test subject reads from his paper, BBC is just stalling the good news. The second tomato leaves the table at 152 miles per hour and slams into the jaw of the second test subject, causing a hairline fracture and a chipped tooth. The third test subject looks at the ending to the joke on his paper and begins to shake nervously. He speaks two words which he knows will not end well for him. That blows. The third SCP-504 tomato flies off the table, slams into the third test subject's head, and instantly knocks him out. The test subject is sent to the hospital with a massive skull fracture. The next day, Dr. Blast bursts into the observation room and reprimands the research team. I thought we just established that recordings work in place of live subjects, screams Dr. Blast. I know how much you guys hate Class Ds, especially D-50412, but the poor guy might not ever recover before his termination rolls around. I'm making it clear right now that whoever oversaw this round of testing is getting serious reprimand. The same goes for whoever leaked its video logs to the staff. Everyone is silent. From somewhere within the group of researchers, there's a snicker. Then they all break out in laughter. After this incident, no Class Ds or other personnel are used in research being conducted on SCP-504. The research team wheels in a television playing the Sarah Palin and Hillary Clinton SNL skit. The tomato shows signs of confusion as it flies off the table. Its trajectory includes three separate bursts of speed over 200 miles per hour, two stretches of motion at normal throwing speed, and one unprecedented instance of the tomato moving backwards. This all occurs during the flight of a single SCP-504 tomato during the SNL skit. The working hypothesis is that the tomato was unsure whether to take the video seriously or not. The research team later finds out that SCP-504 really hates science and mathematics jokes when they bring in a laptop that plays a pre-recorded engineering joke. Over the speakers, a mechanical voice can be heard saying, 2009 is going to be a complex year. We already know the real part. We still have to find the imaginary part. At the conclusion of the joke, there's a supersonic blast and the computer is completely vaporized by the tomato's kinetic energy. The sensors recorded an approximate speed of 2,174 miles per hour as the tomato flew across the room. The conclusion of the experiments on SCP-504 end with another computer being brought into the test room. 
The computers begin to play the Monty Python sketch of the funniest joke in the world. Toward the end of the skit, the Allied forces are reciting the funniest joke in the world in German to defeat the Nazis. The actors chant, When is das Nunstruck get uns Slothermeyer? Ja, Bier Hund das Oder, die Flipper volt gersput. At the end of the joke, the tomato explodes on the table where it once sat. Debris from the tomato coats the entire room, including the computer. The researchers conclude that SCP-504 did not know what to do with the funniest joke in the world, so it self-terminated. Dr. Blass sits in the cafeteria quietly eating his lunch, reading over the logs for the SCP-504 experiments. Suddenly, a commotion breaks out in the kitchen. There are screams of terror. Dr. Blass jumps out of his seat, runs to the kitchen door, and pushes it open. To his surprise, he sees slices of tomatoes flying around the room. Someone on the research team thought it'd be funny to give the unknowing kitchen staff SCP-504 tomatoes to see what would happen. After they had been cut up and put into food for the day, someone in the kitchen told a bad joke, and the tomato slices flew around like shurikens. Dr. Blass sees a group of researchers peering through a kitchen window and laughing hysterically. He'll get to the bottom of which researchers did this, and they will be fired from the SCP Foundation. Sometimes the most elusive anomaly in this world is true love. The endless carousel of blind dates, the hours of fruitless swiping on a variety of dating apps, and the cringe-inducing awkwardness of bar hopping can sometimes be all too much to bear. But don't give up just yet. If modern dating's got you down, then we've got the perfect show for you. It's time for some matchmaking merriment the likes of which the world has never seen. So sit back, relax, and get ready to fall in love. Live from the SCP Foundation, it's the SCP Dating Game! We've assembled the Foundation's most eligible bachelors, bachelorettes, and entities of indeterminate gender who are ready to secure, contain, and protect your heart. Without further ado, let's get right to it and meet our first fabulous contestant. Meet SCP-096. If you like the introverted type, then this bachelor might just be for you. He prefers to keep to himself and spends most of his time hiding his face and crying uncontrollably in the corner of his cell. Isn't it refreshing to find a guy who's so in touch with his emotions? It might take some work to get him out of his shell, but if you're patient and kind, then you'll be surprised at what he's capable of. 096 enjoys long walks through the remote mountains, sad movies, and being appreciated for what's on the inside rather than what he looks like. Just make sure you honor his boundaries. And never, ever look at his face. And you could be the companion this shy guy is looking for. But maybe you're looking for someone more talkative. The kind of person who commands the room at a dinner party with an amazing story. If your idea of the perfect partner is someone who has lived a wild, fascinating, dangerous life, then you'll love our next dashing contestant. He's SCP-1867. But you can call him Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood. That's right. Not only is he charming and bold, but he has a title, too. Don't be fooled by the fact that he's a tiny sea slug. Lord Blackwood is a master adventurer and hunter, and has faced some of the most incredible and deadly things this world has to offer. All he wants is someone to share them with. If you're ready to travel across the globe with a gentleman slug, then get ready to pack a bag and set off on life's great adventure together. Maybe you prefer your experiences to be more digital, no jet setting for you, you'd rather stay home and flirt through your phone. If you're into the technological side of love, but are looking for an alternative to the dreaded dating apps, then this next contestant could be the one for you. All you have to do to meet them is download one free app, Malover 1.0.0, and you get to meet SCP-1471. This is one attentive partner. They'll text you every few hours, and you'll get to see them everywhere even when they're not really there. If you're feeling a bit put off by their skull face and shadowy body, maybe you should work on being a little less shallow. Don't judge a book by its cover. They just really want to check in and see how you're doing, and make sure you never ever feel lonely. But hey, maybe that's all a little too much darkness for you. Maybe you're looking for someone sweeter. Meet SCP-2396, also known as Miss Sweetie. She's a lovely lady who's all about appreciating the bright side of life, even when things get sour. If you get hungry while on a date with her, good news! She can spontaneously generate her own hard candy. No more paying through the nose for movie theater concessions. Your date's got the snacks covered. Now, be advised, she's not the fondest of men, so the fellows out there might want to steer clear. But everyone else should try and see just how sweet life together can be. Are you feeling lovesick and starting to think there might not be a cure? Then you might need a doctor. A plague doctor, to be exact. 
Our next eligible anomaly is SCP-049. And not only does he have an impressive career, I mean, come on, he's a doctor, but he's also a big believer in working toward the greater good. This dapper, refined Frenchman, so you know he's a natural romantic, believes in healing the world, taking care of others, and making sure everyone is feeling well. If you're looking for someone to heal your heart, look no further. This beaked bachelor has got the magic touch. Speaking of impressive resumes, if a doctor isn't enough for you, then how about a king? That's right, the Scarlet King himself is our next contestant. This hunk of burning hatred is tall, dark, and unknowable by our tiny mortal minds. If you're attracted to power, influence, and unbridled evil, and don't mind he's got a few children already, then you can take the throne by his side and reign over chaos together. Some people look for a partner that's powerful and intimidating, but others prefer an everyman. SCP-507 is a friendly, average guy who just so happens to be extremely well-traveled. We're not talking about a semester abroad in Europe. This guy's travel history is completely out of this world. He's not afraid to be spontaneous. In fact, he can't stop himself from taking a trip at a moment's notice. <laughs> so if you're the kind of person who's always looking for your next weird, wild, exotic getaway, then 507 might just be your perfect match. You've got to be willing to roll with some weirdness, though, because some of the trips 507 takes include extreme temperatures, bizarre landscapes, and an ominous, smiling man. But think of the memories you'll share that will only bring you and your dimension-hopping bow even closer together. Would you take a walk on the wild side? If so, you're in luck, because our next bachelorette, SCP-953, is a real fox. No, seriously, she's a fox. She's highly adaptable, capable of shape-shifting, and she loves to cook. Her favorite dish is liver, though she prefers to eat it raw. She's an elegant, charismatic lady with an appreciation for the finer things in life, like plum wine. So why not join her for a drink and just see where it goes? Just be polite, don't call her a kitsune, and make sure your date isn't anywhere near a dog park. This next eligible bachelorette is a great fit for anyone who doesn't place a high value on looks. That's not to say she's unattractive but you won't be able to look at her. It's SCP-347, or Claudia, and she just so happens to be completely invisible. Claudia has a great sense of humor, a love of pranks, and a variety of talents, including lockpicking. With her talent for theft, you won't have to worry about being the sole breadwinner. She's a great gal to come home to if you're sick of spending time alone in an empty apartment, but still want your apartment to look like it's empty. Just make sure you give any house guests a heads up before they come over that your house isn't haunted. You just have an invisible girlfriend. Do you like an older man? How about a man as old as the universe itself? Great news, here comes SCP-343, also known as God. This good-natured silver fox is massively powerful and apparently omnipotent. He knows absolutely everything about everything. You wouldn't be able to keep any secrets from him, but think of how you'd wipe the floor with everyone at Bar Trivia. And up next, we have SCP-2430, the immortal Hitler clone. Ha ha ha, just kidding. Can you even imagine? Even we wouldn't stoop that low. <laughs> Moving on. Do you like the bad boy type? A misanthrope? Someone you can bond with over your shared hatred of, well, everything? You sound like kind of a bummer, to be honest, but there's an SCP match that suits you perfectly. SCP-682 would absolutely love to hate with you. This massive, extremely intelligent reptile is one rude dude with a bad attitude. 682 is also ready for anything that life could throw at it, capable of adapting to any situation. Sure, this creature wants to destroy every living thing in its path and seems unwilling to stop until the entire world has been eradicated, but come on, you can change him. If you're into Boston accents, then pay close attention to our next entry. SCP-527, a fancy little gentleman by the name of Mr. Fish. Why is he called Mr. Fish? I mean, come on, look at him. He's a guy with a fish head. He can't breathe underwater or talk to other fish or do anything unusual at all, really. He's just a guy from Boston looking for love. He just so happens to have the head of a fish with a teeny tiny little top hat. He's ready for any formal occasion you might need someone to accompany you to. A wedding, the opera, your nephew's bar mitzvah. But hey, if he's not your pick, there are plenty of fish in the sea. <laughs> that joke was terrible. Speaking of C, our next contestant is one tall drink of water. 
SCP-054, the water nymph, is a shape-shifting creature made up entirely of ordinary water that just so happens to take on the shape of a humanoid woman. She'd love to go swimming with you, have a fun day at a water park, or play a game of shape-shifting charades. If this sounds like a wave you'd like to catch, throw on a swimsuit and get ready to dive into a future with SCP-054. Your body is mostly water, so you two already have a lot in common. It's really important to have shared interests in a romantic partnership. And if you consider yourself a foodie, then this next contestant is for you. Meet SCP-082, Ferdinand. Hailing from France, ooh la la. Ferdinand speaks fluent French and English. He's always smiling the same enormous smile, no matter what life throws at him. He's tall too, standing at approximately 8 feet and weighing around 700 pounds. There's just so much of him to love. This guy loves to cook just as much as he loves to eat, though he's probably not a great fit for a vegetarian. He loves his meat. He also has a passion for fashion and culture, enjoying fine clothing, television and films, novels, and singing classical music. This is a man with exceptional taste and a hunger for all of the finest things in life. If refined gentleman interests you, but you're not sure about someone with such a voracious appetite, then this next contestant is more your speed, especially if you're a bit of an Anglophile. Mr. Deeds can be summoned via SCP-662 or the butler's handbell. If you ring it, he'll appear, ready to attend to your every need. A proper English butler, Mr. Deeds is a generous partner intent on keeping others satisfied. He's an especially good fit for someone busy who needs a little help around the house. Mr. Deeds is the perfect house husband, ready to greet you at the door with a hot meal and listen to you talk about your long day at the office. Just don't be afraid to ask for what you need from him. He can help you if you don't ask. The next contestant with us today has got some killer hair. SCP-352 Baba Yaga has so much going for her. She's got maturity, knowledge, superhuman healing abilities, and a bite that causes the nervous system to shut down. Her hobbies include cannibalism, long strolls through the enchanted forest, and crafting web-like traps out of her hair. She's lived long enough to know exactly what she wants, and maybe what she wants is you. If you happen to speak Old Russian and have a taste for human flesh, then the two of you can play house together in a lovely forest cottage on top of some chicken legs and abduct any unwitting travelers that wander into your midst. You know what they say, the couple that prays together stays together. If you love an older paramour, but you're looking for someone with a bit more masculine energy, then our next bachelor is the perfect pick. SCP-106 or the old man has traveled all the way from his pocket dimension lair to hunt for one thing, someone to love. Now his appearance might be startling at first, but if you give him a chance to get close to you, he's guaranteed to melt your heart. This next fellow has taken some time off from his busy professional life to come here and compete for someone special to call his own. He's a career man, dedicated to his job, but he's also got room in his life for romance. It's SCP-1879, the indoor salesman. He's an ambitious guy with a passion for sales and doesn't like to take no for an answer. His hobbies include sales, sales, and more sales. In addition to appearing inside your home when you least expect it, driving a hard bargain and smooth talk. He's a slick charmer who's promising the deal of a lifetime on a one-of-a-kind product, his heart. Maybe you don't want a businessman. Maybe you want a guy whose career is a bit more whimsical. Someone with an artistic side, a sense of humor, or someone who can clown around from time to time. Well, you ought to meet SCP-2094, Motormouth. He's a multi-talented guy, skilled at juggling, gymnastics, and acrobatics, and stretching his lower jaw up to two meters in any direction to engulf just about any item. Never pay for storage space again. Motormouth can store anything you need him to in his extra-dimensional second stomach. You'll never be bored again, that's a guarantee. Now, if looks are more important to you than personality, like way more important, then feast your eyes on our next competitor. It's SCP-056, a beautiful person. What's her type? Tall, short, blonde, brunette, redhead, beard, or shaven? Ha! Doesn't matter. No matter what you like, 056 will change its shape to become appealing to you. No one knows what this entity's original form looks like, but it's always gorgeous and it always looks like the most appealing person an observer can imagine. Talk about knowing how to read the room. 
If you have a more dominant personality, then you should keep looking, because this entity likes its partners on the submissive side. It knows that it's superior to you and wants to make sure you know it too. But if you're looking for someone gorgeous to worship and don't mind them being rude all the time and knowing more than you do about everything, then you and 056 can make a life together filled with beauty and disdain. For our next contestant, let's see what's behind door number three. It's SCP-303. Actually, this contestant is behind every door, any door, anywhere. No matter where you are, if there's a door, it will appear on the other side. You'll know when it's there, just listen for the sound of its wheezing breathing. That sound means you're not alone, and you'll never have to be again. Don't be nervous, SCP-303 is more afraid of you than you are of it. Love is all about facing your fears. So open up the door to your heart and let SCP-030 come inside. Our next eligible bachelor is a little bit prickly on the outside, but he's got a soft heart beneath that spiky exterior. It's SCP-2800 Cactus Man, here to save the day and sweep you off your feet. His real name is Daniel McIntyre, and yes, he is Scottish. Not only does he have the DNA of a Seguro cactus and the ability to grow spines all over his body, he also has a super cute accent. He's able to conserve water as well, using only a third of the water a normal human being would use, so he's an ideal partner for the particularly environmentally conscious. He may be hot, but his body tolerates extreme temperatures and keeps him from overheating or becoming dehydrated. If you have to be stranded on a desert island, this is the man you'd want with you. This next contestant is a real doll. SCP-136 loves to laugh, loves attention, and is full of surprises. Give her a chance and she's guaranteed to get your heart rate up. Good news, she's already behind you. Oh wow, that is a special surprise. We have with us here the host of another classic show, Laugh is Fun, also known as SCP-2030. Laffy McLafferson here is a real goofball, just a silly little prankster who enjoys playing jokes, watching inanimate objects eat people alive, and making people laugh. Laugh, 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 laugh! Sorry, I don't know what came over me there. I wasn't really myself. But don't look away yet. This contestant loves constant eye contact and wants to keep your undivided attention. SCP-173 is a living work of art a sculpture to be exact, that can only move when it's not being observed. So as long as you're keeping an eye on 173, you'll never lose it. Up next is a bit of a local celebrity around these parts, Dr. Bright. His consciousness lives inside of an amulet and after years of trauma, he's not the best at opening up to people. But if you're okay with an emotionally long distance relationship, you can definitely make things work. Our final contestant is looking for someone who loves to laugh, have fun, and get silly once in a while. Here comes the Tickle Monster! It's SCP-999. This gelatinous gem wants nothing more than to cheer you up, give you a big hug, and make sure you're having a wonderful day. 999 has a world of love to share, and simply coming into contact with its slimy surface is enough to make you smile. Not only does 999 help people feel better, but it also smells good to everyone who meets it, bringing a comforting aroma to your shared home. You don't have to worry about cooking for it either, as its diet consists entirely of candy. Every day is a new chance to laugh and play with SCP-999 if it tickles your fancy. And heck, if you're eager to hang out with SCP-999 that you don't even want to wait for a date, you can always go to scpswag.com and get yourself a high-quality SCP-999 plushie. Just saying. So, who's your lucky date going to be? Do you want to play it safe or take a walk on the wild side? Take a weekend trip with SCP-507? Or try to convince SCP-682 that you're the only human out there who isn't DISGUSTING? Let us know your pick in the comments below, and let your love story finally begin. As we grow up and get older, our bodies begin to change. Sometimes those changes can be a bit uncomfortable, or even bizarre. We feel strange pains in new places. We grow seemingly a foot in height overnight. Hair sprouts up in new places and falls out of other places. Whether it's puberty or just the aging process, it seems like the human body never runs out of ways to surprise us. But those surprises are completely normal, 
and to be expected as part of being alive. Unless you're one particular young man whose body changed overnight into something unrecognizable and entirely anomalous. That's when a very special individual we'll be calling Matt Terra comes in. Matt was an ordinary 24-year-old man, with nothing particularly interesting about him. Sure, he was a nice guy, he was smart, he was great at chess and video games, and had an impressive memory for science trivia. But there was nothing unusual about him. Every day he would get up, go to work at a board game and comic book store, chat with his co-workers and make a few sales, head home, make dinner, relax, and go to bed ready to do it all again the next day. It wasn't a glamorous life or that exciting, but it was a pleasant life, and he was happy to live it. One night Matt was having a difficult time sleeping. He was tossing and turning, waking up every few minutes to a dull, aching feeling in his stomach. He didn't feel feverish or sick, and the pain wasn't sharp or indicative of an emergency, so he shrugged it off as indigestion and tried to get back to sleep. We've all been there, right? Eventually, he nodded off all the way. He woke up the next morning blurry-eyed and exhausted from the rough night, but feeling otherwise fine. He climbed out of bed, stretched, and headed to the bathroom to brush his teeth. There in the mirror, he saw something that made him think he might still be dreaming. He pinched himself and found that he was indeed awake. While he was sleeping, somehow his body had changed into something completely impossible. Where his stomach had once been, there was a blue, green, and brown orb that reminded him of a photograph he had once seen. A picture of Earth, taken aboard the International Space Station. After calling into work and explaining in a stammering voice that he would not be coming in that day, Matt did the only thing he could think of. He went to the hospital. Of course, the doctors had no idea what to do with him. It wasn't like they could just take out his appendix or give him an antibiotic. None of them had ever seen anything like this before. Fortunately for him, one doctor knew a lot more than he was letting on. Matt wouldn't be the first human to develop bizarre anomalous traits and then stagger into a nearby hospital for treatment. That's why the SCP Foundation has agents embedded in major hospitals all across the world. And one such doctor was the man treating Matt. On the downside, he wouldn't be enjoying his freedom much longer. On the upside, it'd cost a hell of a lot less than a regular uninsured hospital visit. So the field agent called up his superiors, wiped Matt's record from the hospital, and soon after a group of Foundation agents came to collect the confused, unfortunate host of what soon would be known as SCP-007. SCP-007 is found within an abdominal cavity on the body of Matt, also referred to as the subject, just below his ribcage where his stomach would be. Most of his abdomen is completely missing, including the muscles, skin, and organs that should ordinarily be necessary for his survival. However, he does not appear to experience any pain or even discomfort from his condition. SCP-007 itself is a spherical planet composed of soil and water, none of which actually touches any part of his body. The planet resembles a miniature duplicate of Earth, about 60 centimeters in diameter, with its own weather patterns and gravitational pull, neither of which appear to have any effect on the subject, nor do they seem to be affected by his movements or behavior. There are also a variety of tiny organisms dwelling on the planet's surface that cannot be seen with the naked eye. Though it greatly resembles Earth, there are some notable differences. Obviously, instead of floating in space and revolving around the Sun, this planet does not appear to have an orbit. It is uncertain where the organisms on the planet get their light from, though it does not seem to be our Sun, since the organisms have not shown any negative effects from the lack of sunlight and presence of artificial light in the Foundation's site. There are continents visible on the planet's surface, surrounded by its sea, but they do not resemble a continental alignment that can be traced to any point in our Earth's history. As far for the life on the small planet, the organisms navigating the surface of the world inside Matt's abdomen, there are dozens of identifiable species that bear a passing resemblance to creatures on Earth. There are blue, cow-like livestock, species of bird that appear to have scales, red and orange trees, and other plant life, and two intelligent species that are notably and significantly humanoid in appearance and behavior. Observation of these intelligent species via microscope and digital imaging has revealed that they operate in societies and are consistently developing and improving their technology. 
Though their technology was incredibly rudimentary when Matt was first brought into containment, resembling early nomadic human civilizations, it has progressed to the level of 15th century humanity. The research team assigned to SCP-007 has noticed the recent introduction of a version of the printing press, used to produce what appear to be pamphlets and even entire books. The language these books are printed in is unrecognizable, and so the contents of these materials are currently unknown. But the citizens of the planet clearly have a grasp of the written word and both the technology and the desire to share it amongst themselves. They have also developed an agricultural system. Their farms have progressed to the point of using new innovations such as windmills used to mill grain, wheelbarrows used to transport crops and other supplies, and the practice of crop rotation. Unfortunately, with these positive developments comes the ability to escalate conflicts and wage wars. They look to have created parachutes, gunpowder, and other explosives, and their own versions of the muzzle-loaded rifle. However, in spite of the ugliness of battle, there is beauty too. The people of the planet have created new ways to express themselves, with what can only be described as new instruments closely resembling the piano, the mandolin, and the bagpipes. As exciting and even moving as it can be to watch these tiny beings grow and change, building their own miniature society, it is also a bit troubling. As these people continue to progress at such a fast rate, it stands to reason that they will eventually catch up to us, or even surpass us in terms of technology. The research team has not yet made any attempts to communicate with the inhabitants of the abdominal planet, concerned about influencing the developments of its societies in any way, or compromising their ability to observe them without interfering, but they may not be able to keep this up for much longer. What will happen if these tiny beings continue to follow in our footsteps and create their very own space programs? If they leave their planet's atmosphere, they will discover the truth that their world is buried in the abdomen of what is, to them, a giant man. That reality would be enough to shatter the sanity of many of us, and it would likely cause chaos on their world. There has been a great deal of debate amongst the research team about what to do if this should happen. Some insist that the team should continue to passively observe until the issue comes up, while others believe that they should attempt to make contact with the inhabitants of the planet in order to soften the eventual blow to their perceptions when they attempt space exploration. Currently, the debate rages on, as the research team keeps an eye on the progression of the little civilizations. Hopefully, if they do eventually make contact, they will find a way to make it clear that we come in peace. So, who is Matt Terra, the subject? He is a highly intelligent young man, with a shockingly casual attitude towards his body's anomalous properties. When asked about the planet, he simply says, I just woke up one day and there it was. I don't have any idea how it got there. Testing revealed that he is genetically human, and there is nothing unusual or even notable about the rest of his body. He provided his name willingly upon arriving at the SCP Foundation, but no one of his name and age has ever lived in his hometown area according to public records. To verify his identity, he was able to produce a social security card and a driver's license, which did not appear to be forged or altered in any way. However, when the numbers were run through the system, there was no match. Officially, this man does not exist. It is not entirely certain where he came from or why there is no record of him. But one researcher posited that he somehow crossed over from a parallel dimension or that the presence of his abdominal planet added as a kind of cognitohazardous effect to him that erased all perception of him from any records. Whatever the case may be, wherever he came from, he is here now. Because he has not yet attempted escape or even shown a desire to leave the Foundation's site, there are no strict containment procedures in place. The only active containment procedures for SCP-007 are for the subject's safety and security. He lives in a sealed room with furniture and other items, which are granted upon request as long as they do not pose a security risk. The subject's room includes an easy chair, a bed, a beanbag chair, a television with access to several movie and television streaming services, a number of video game consoles, an espresso machine, a microwave, a refrigerator, an exercise bike, and a bookshelf filled with books and graphic novels. Though he does not appear to require food or water in order to survive, he enjoys consuming both food and drinks, and is especially fond of coffee, sodas, grape juice, sour cream and onion potato chips, mangoes, and the occasional treat of Chinese takeout, an opinion which he shares with the eccentric Dr. Clef. 
The head researcher assigned to SCP-007, Dr. Cho, has a weekly game of chess with Matt, during which he evaluates the subject's mental health and general emotional well-being. Over the course of these games, the two have developed a friendly relationship, with each man winning about half of the time. Matt asks about Dr. Cho's family, and in return, Dr. Cho checks in about his containment situation, seeing if there's anything the Foundation can provide to make his time with them more comfortable. Most recently, Matt requested a computer with an internet connection, mainly so that he could play his video games in online co-op mode, but this request was denied out of a concern that it would compromise Foundation security. Sympathetic to his desire for company, Dr. Cho has begun to allow the subject to have visits with SCP-507, who will stop by his containment facility during his inactive periods for a movie night or some video games. Matt has described 507 as his best friend, aside from Dr. Cho. In spite of the intricate world inexplicably floating in his body, the subject leads a relatively simple life. He does not seem to be restless or resentful at all. In fact, he seems largely content. Though his future is uncertain, and he is living through a completely unprecedented anomalous experience, he is probably one of the happiest anomalies contained at the SCP Foundation, and definitely one of the most at peace with his anomalous status. Whatever happens next for him, he will probably be ready for it with a smile, and there's something we can all learn from that. Here we are again with the Anomatron 6000 our state-of-the-art simulation computer that helps us create hyper-accurate simulations of some of the world's most bizarre scenarios. Whether it's SCP-096 vs. Siren Head, Abel vs. Chainsaw Man, or now perhaps our most ridiculous matchup yet, SCP-035 The Diabolical Possessive Mask vs. The Mask, the popular Jim Carrey character based on the hyper-violent comic book of the same name. So, what the heck are we waiting for? Let's crank up the machine and see what the results are. Somebody stop me! Okay, so what have we got on intake today? Researcher Werb asked, a tone of boredom hanging off his every word. A uh, possible anomalous entity? His compatriot Dr. Mackney replied, sipping his coffee, sounding equally as unenthused. Caucasian male, early 30s, a team of our agents picked him up in... The Foundation doctor checked his notes. Some place called Edge City? Real appealing tourist spot. He added sarcastically. Now, oh, what's so anomalous about him? Werb questioned. His eyes lazily scanned over a file Mackney had handed him. Says here he's just an ordinary bank teller. There's one prior arrest on his record, but the charges were dropped later on. Man, this guy's a nobody. Apparently, he was in possession of an anomalous artifact, came the doctor's reply. He looked through the one way glass into the interrogation room, sat at the table wearing a matching pair of hideous pajamas, was a wiry, brown haired man. What was it? Researcher Werb asked, not bothering to check the file. A mask, apparently, Macme replied. This thing can form a symbiotic connection with whoever wears it. This guy's had it for a while. It causes him to undergo a dramatic intensification of his personality when he puts it on, as well as granting him some, uh, unusual abilities. Hold on, aren't you just describing SCP-035? Werb said, looking confused. Nope, the doctor responded by handing him a clear evidence bag. And it was a single wooden mask, a dull, darkish green tint to the object. It looked to be almost Viking in its design, with three holes on its surface, one for the mouth and two for the eyes. It was hard to deny it was completely different from the white porcelain of SCP-035. What's this guy's name again? Werb sighed, looking at the scruffy, pajama-clad man waiting for them. Ipkiss, his colleague replied. Stanley Ipkiss. Meanwhile, locked up tight in a hermetically sealed glass case was another anomalous mask. SCP-035 was kept under lock and key by the Foundation, guarded constantly by a pair of armed security officers. One of them, Officer Regert, had noticed something strange about the infamous possessive mask today, or stranger than usual anyway. SCP-035 was known to compel people to wear it if they were close enough, often through subtle, psychic whispers, but today it seemed restless, almost agitated, like it found something nearby to be intensely annoying. I already told you everything I know, Stanley Ipkiss sighed exhaustedly. He'd been dragged out of bed at the crack of dawn by strange agents and was now being interrogated about what he knew of the wooden mask he'd come across floating in the river one fateful night. I don't know where it came from, I swear, I didn't even realize I still had it. Uh, we threw it back in the river, but my dog must have swum out and fetched it, Stanley explained. 
You have no idea what this thing is, not even from any first-hand experience, Mr. Ipkiss? Dr. Macney asked, holding the mask up. Look, I did take it to a psychologist who told me it might be Scandinavian, a representation of some Norse night god, uh, Loki, I think, he answered. We're not interested in this mask as a historical art piece, researcher Werb retorted. Tell us what happens when you put it on. Stanley paused for a moment, clearly aware he was in real trouble, but nervous about coughing up the details to his shady captors. With a sigh, he decided it was best to confess. I don't know how it works, but whenever you put it on, it's like it brings your deepest desires to life. When I wear that mask, I can do anything, be anything, he described, remembering a key detail. But it only works at night. Dr. Macney and researcher Werb exchanged looks, uncertain if Ibkiss was just a lunatic or if there was truth to what he was telling them. Assemble a security team, Macney sighed. We'll arrange a safe environment for you tonight, Mr. Ibkiss. Elsewhere in the facility, Regert and his fellow security officer, Duggan, was watching over SCP-035 with growing concern. What do you reckon has this thing so agitated? Duggan wondered aloud. Who knows? Regert sighed. I've already reported it to command, told them 035's in a mood. They said to proceed as normal. Suddenly, as the words left his mouth, Officer Regert felt strange. It was like he had been hooked by an overwhelming urge to put the possessive mask on. He barely noticed he had reached to unlock the door sealing the area where SCP-035 was contained in its case, and as he stepped through, Officer Dugan's pleas for him to stop barely registered. The other officer tried in vain to pull Regard back as he walked towards the possessive mask, only to feel his co-worker grip his shirt and swing him face first over and over again into the glass case containing the anomalous object. His body going completely limp after being used to break the glass, Rieger dropped Dugan to the floor, too lost in his trance-like state, to realize he'd just killed a fellow Foundation security officer. He was too focused on SCP-035 as he lifted it up and placed it over his face. Meanwhile, Stanley Ipkiss had been brought to a testing area, a team of security officers standing around him. The fact that they were all armed did little to ease Stanley's nerves. Dr. Macney strode up to him, pulling the green wooden mask out of the airtight bag it had been sealed in, and handed it to Stanley. No funny business, Mr. Ipkiss, the doctor warned. I really can't promise that, Stanley replied. He looked at the mask in his hands, noticed a green shimmer over the reverse side of it. As much as he had gladly given it up, part of him had missed wearing it. He could already hear the low rumbling of thunder outside as he lifted it towards his face, feeling it almost leap out of his hands and latch itself onto him. The green mask eagerly became attached to Stanley, the surface of it spreading out where it covered his face and wrap around his entire head. Around him, the guards cautiously stepped back as they watched Stanley convulse and writhe around the place uncontrollably, like a man possessed. Both researcher Word and Dr. Macney looked at each other in wordless disbelief before turning back to the scene unfolding before their eyes. The booming noise of thunder and cracks of lightning rang out, despite this all taking place indoors, as Stanley Ipkiss vanished in the center of a miniature tornado that spun wildly around the testing area before slowing to a halt. In its place stood a maniacal wide-eyed figure, dressed in a garish yellow zoot suit and wearing an enormous toothed grin on his bright green face. How do, fellas? The mask bombastically hooted at the guards. Having been trained to deal with absurd anomalies aplenty, the security team all defensively raised their weapons out of a mix of instinct and confusion. Eesh, rough crowd, <laughs> the green-faced lunatic stated to nobody. It looked like he had turned aside as if addressing some invisible audience. Outstretching both arms and one leg, the mask instantly zipped off, hurling around the room in a whirlwind of absurdity, in the style of an old Tex Avery cartoon. The spinning, cackling combination of Stanley Ipkiss and the magical mask weaved in between the Foundation guards, all of whom tried in vain to restrain him until he disappeared out of the door. After him! Dr. Macney yelled with urgency in his voice. The guards all turned to run after the mask, only for each one of them to trip over and land face first on the floor of the testing area, as if something had tied them all up by their ankles. It was only after the security officers all struggled back up to their feet that they noticed their pants had been yanked down, leaving the Foundation's finest somewhat embarrassed, to say the least. Outside the testing area, Stanley, or rather the mask, had already closed the door behind him. Out of nowhere, he produced a series of wooden planks and began hammering them into the doorframe, 
boarding it up before speedily adding chains and padlocks to the mix. Sighing and in an over-exaggerated manner, wiping the sweat from his brow, he turned around, only to be met with the sight of even more SCP Foundation guards lying in wait, their guns all trained on him. The mask gave a scream of pure terror that briefly sent his skull popping out of his head and his eyes shooting out of his skull before everything zipped right back into its original place. His eyes darted around at the faces of the Foundation security, wondering how he was going to get out of this one. Oh gee, this all seems familiar, he said either to himself or his audience. Well, if it ain't broken, hit it! In the blink of an eye, the mask's bright yellow outfit had transformed replaced by a silk blue rumba shirt with ruffled sleeves, white pants, and a wide-brim black hat. As they watched him stood at the ready, a few of the guards noticed the sound of… music? Not one of them could tell where it was coming from, nor could they help starting to tap their feet or bob their heads to the rhythm of the Cuban Pete rumba. The entire security team quickly erupted into a full-blown dance number that anyone who saw it couldn't resist joining, all led by the mask, wildly waving maracas in the air and singing. Elsewhere in the facility, Officer Riegert was beginning to melt. He still had SCP-035 covering his face, the frown of the possessive mask conveying the entity's sheer discontent. The black ooze secreting from its porcelain surface had the unfortunate effect of corroding and melting down anyone that wore it dissolving them entirely after a short period of time. Determined, SCP-035 pushed on, plotting its host towards a storage room. If it remembered correctly, the SCP Foundation had stored a number of temporary hosts for it, mannequins that, while not human, had enough of a humanoid shape for the possessive mask to use. Of course, after all of its attempts to escape, the Foundation had rescinded its privilege to be granted new hosts, not that it could stop it from taking them by force. Using the last of Officer Riegert's dwindling strength, SCP-035 barged its way into the storeroom. Sure enough, waiting there for it was a row of discarded mannequins. Lifting Riegert's hands before they had fully melted away, the possessive mask used him to place itself on a new body. Elsewhere not too far away in the Foundation facility, a conga line of security officers and research personnel was parading through the corridors, all happily dancing and jiving to the music, despite still no one being able to figure out where it was coming from. Dashing away from his spot at the front of the line, the mask zipped around a corner, his clothes having changed back to his signature brightly colored zoot suit. Never say no to a party, he exclaimed after having danced his way to freedom. The sound of something shuffling closer quickly caught the mask's attention. He turned around to find himself standing green face to porcelain face with SCP-035. You. The masked mannequin raised a hollow arm, pointing a finger from its host at Stanley. You bear the god of mischief's carving. I could sense its presence since you arrived. Still in my look, nobody likes a copycat fella, the mask replied. Although intimidation is the sincerest form of flattery, and that's how Jim Carrey's career started. <laughs> he added, exploding with raucous laughter. Cease your prattling! SCP-035 hissed with spite. Say, perhaps we're related. The mask ignored it. Oh, we could be long lost family. You know, I always wanted kids of my own. Son of the mask has a nice ring to it, right? He paused once again, turning away to his unseen audience. On second thought, maybe not. The SCP-035 controlled mannequin leapt forward, gripping the mask's arm causing him to scream in shock at the advanced. His eyes bulged out of their sockets, zooming in on the corrosive black secretions oozing from SCP-035. The mannequin's other hand started reaching upwards, gripping his oversized green head as if it were trying to lift the mask right off of Stanley's face. Zooming away again, he sped down the nearest corridor his arms stretching behind him, still clamped in SCP-035's grip. Coming to a screeching halt with the comical sound of car brakes, the mask wobbled his outstretched arm. A ripple traveled all the way along the elongated limb, as if it was made of elastic. His wrist still being held by the mannequin sporting the possessive mask, the force of the flailing rubbery arm was so great that it flung SCP-035's host body around, sending it head first into the ceiling then plummeting back down to the ground. Its grip loosened, allowing the mask to reel back its stretchy arm, although it didn't return to normal length right away. His own hand pinged back and hit him in the face, only to start urgently trying to communicate of its own accord. What's that, boy? The mask said to his hand as it started performing a series of signals. Little Timmy stuck down a well. You'd like a Friday night off? 
There's a two-bit chump wearing another mask walking menacingly down the hall towards us? The hand suddenly turned the mask's head to look in the right direction. Sure enough, SCP-035 was using the mannequin to walk down the hall towards him. His elongated arm quickly returned to its normal size as the green-faced lunatic took a quick draw stance facing his oncoming adversary. Now, you have to ask yourself one question. He sneered, doing a fairly convincing impression of a green Clint Eastwood. Do I feel lucky? With a sweep of his hand, the mask had drawn an enormous weapon. The thing was a gigantic mass of different artillery, clicking and whirring. There were barrels on top of barrels, rockets, and other explosives locked into place. Do I feel lucky? The mask continued. Well, do you, punk? SCP-035 did nothing to slow its advance, so the mask pulled the trigger. Every one of his weapon's various components spat out a tiny flag with the word BANG written on it. Ah, performance issue, he said, doing his aside once again. Not that I'm overcompensating for anything. Clearly growing agitated, piloting its host, SCP-035 started charging towards the mask. Immediately, he spun around, becoming a tornado of hyperactivity and whooping noises as he sped down the adjacent corridor. The possessive mask staggered after him. The ooze leaking from the porcelain anomaly was dripping onto the mannequin wearing it, causing the plastic to be melted away, exposing the flimsy metal skeleton beneath. It knew it had to merge with a new host, find something else to corrupt. SCP-035 chased after the cartoonish troublemaker, knowing that if it could catch him, he'd be able to survive merging with it. His body, while wearing the other mask, barely obeyed the laws of physics, making him invulnerable to damage and possibly even the corrosive substance oozing from the possessive mask. As if those weren't enough reasons, his powers seemed virtually limitless. Combined with the green-headed lunatic, SCP-035 could do anything. Reaching a stop at the end of another corridor, the mask spun around, wearing a comically undersized baseball uniform. He reached into his pocket and produced an oversized baseball bat, then proceeded to start hurling baseballs into the air and swatting them as hard as he could. As the mask increased the speed of his swings, a volley of hard cork baseballs were fired down the corridor like a barrage of bullets, ricocheting off the walls and hitting the oncoming SCP-035. Each one struck its target, reeling the mannequin, but doing little much else to stop it getting closer and closer, until, with an almighty swing, the mask brought his bat crashing into SCP-035 with enough force to send the possessive mask and its hosts careening down the corridor. It sailed through the air, bursting through a wall, then flew into a research lab, tearing a huge hole in the next wall as it kept going. Finally, it came crashing out of the last wall, the outer wall of the facility, and dropped multiple stories to the ground outside. Changing costumes back to his classic suit and dashing after SCP-035, the mask passed through all the holes his adversary had left in the multiple walls it had crashed into. He screeched to a halt again and paused after getting through the outer wall, only to realize after a moment that he was hovering in mid-air, not standing on anything. Reaching into his suit pocket, the mask pulled out a sign on a stick with a single word written on it. Yikes. He plummeted down to ground level, landing with such an immense crash that his body cracked into the asphalt below. It left a perfect outline of him imprinted in the ground, causing the mask to go completely pancake flat head to toe. Suddenly, before he could peel himself up off the ground and go back to being three-dimensional, SCP-035 staggered to its host's feet and pinned the mask down. Finally, it growled. I've caught you. I've won. Your power is mine. Once I've combined with you, I will be able to ravage this world. I'm going to fuse to your face. Then I'll start with decimating those wretches that imprison me. The foundation will fall, and then so will the rest of their precious world. Forcefully, the mannequin's hand wrenched the mask off the ground. But as SCP-035 turned to look at what it had hoped to be its next host, well, let's just say the tragedy frown carved into its porcelain face had never been more appropriate. It wasn't holding the mask, it was holding a life-size cardboard cutout of a photo of the mask, grinning out from one side. Enraged, the possessive mask tore the decoy in half with its mannequin's hands. Hey, Pachuco! said a cartoonish voice from right behind it. Did you miss me? The mask had reappeared for real this time, grinning with his huge teeth, clearly getting a kick out of having someone to torment. SCP-035, on the other hand, had been getting increasingly irritated by all the wacky cartoon antics. With all the aggression it could channel through its mannequin host, 
had gripped the mask by the throat, his eyes bulging out of his head again. See, no need to get all choked up over it! He gagged. You are so tiresome! The possessive mask yelled, having finally run out of patience. You know what? I won't merge with you. I should just kill you and put an end to your buffoonery. Let me take this thing off you first, though. Its mannequin fingers started to hook into the mask's seam at the back of his bald green head. Wait, wait! The mask begged, putting up both his hands in surrender. At least give me a final request, huh? Master Mask! Before the possessive mask could respond, the mask had swept it off its dissolving mannequin feet. He started to spin it around in a wild, over-the-top dance number, bopping and swinging to a tune that seemed to be coming from nowhere. The longer it went on for, the more and more of SCP-035's host's body started to dissolve away, until the mannequin finally wasted away. All that was left was a bubbling pile of black goo on the ground with the possessive mask laying in the middle. The mask chuckled, noticing the fumes trailing upwards into the air as the corrosive substance melted away the last of SCP-035's host. Talk about smoking! So here's a statement that won't blow anyone's mind. The SCP Foundation is really, really, really weird. And we're not even talking about the actual anomalies they contain. Sure, this top-secret organization puts in the time and the effort to make sure menaces to society like the hard-to-destroy reptile, the Scarlet King, and even the horrifying bad joke tomatoes stay behind lock and key. But sometimes you need to hold the mirror up to yourself and see just what the heck is going on. I mean, seriously, think about it. This is an organization that uses live human beings farmed from death row as test subjects. Considering how rarely the death penalty is actually employed in the Western world these days, you know some shady strings are being pulled there. And what about the O5 Council, the leaders of humanity's last line of defense against anomalous chaos? And according to some accounts, they're a group of vain, petty, and morally bankrupt individuals who regularly use anomalies like SCP-006, the Fountain of Youth, for their own personal benefit. And don't even get me started on the actual scientists working under the Foundation's payroll. That's when things start getting even stranger. Of course, there's Dr. Jack Bright, a man forever changed by the chance interaction with SCP-963, an anomalous medallion, and one of Abel's deadly blades. Now, he's an immortal weirdo who's mm -hmm. equal parts brilliant and a total nuisance, so much so that there's an entire dedicated list forbidding all of his zanier antics. Then there's Dr. Alto Clef, don't even try to shake his hand given how much this ex-GOC wildcard loves using violence to solve his problems. You may draw back a stump. He specializes in reality warping anomalies, often wields a ukulele cause he's just so darn quirky. Oh, and he's very likely the baby daddy to a teenage nature sprite after a dalliance with a goddess. Or, oh, and um, what about Dr. Charles Ogden Gears? Sure, he may not look that strange to the naked eye, He's a man so dull and humorous that gray is his favorite color, and he thinks sugar on cornflakes is an act of unacceptable decadence. But he's got a whole lot of strangeness under the hood. Like the fact he's such an emotionally unavailable father that his daughters across dimensions have formed a splinter cell of the serpent's hand, where they work under the collective pseudonym The Black Queen, just to spite him. Dr. Dan, through acts of sabotage, was personally responsible for the worst SCP-096 outbreak in Foundation history, leading to the end of thousands of lives, just so he could receive clearance to terminate the creature. And he got that clearance, on the condition that the SCP Foundation would be terminating him for his crimes as soon as the goal is achieved. And then there's... Oh my gosh! Did someone dress a dog up in scientist clothes? Oh my god, that's the cutest thing I've ever seen. Oh, this is just bright in my day. Okay, maybe I was being too harsh on the Foundation before. Who, whose dog is this? Excuse me, sir, that is extremely inappropriate. Wait, you can talk? Of course I can talk, you dolt! I'm Professor Kane Pathos Crow, one of the SCP Foundation's finest minds in the field of advanced robotics and biochemistry. I have a level 4 clearance for 343's sake. I'm not some common bloody mutt. Oh. My apologies, Professor Crow. I wasn't aware you were a, <clears throat> well, a talking dog. Well, yes, I imagine there's a lot you don't know about me, isn't there? Um, I'm a little embarrassed to admit it, but uh, that's true, Professor Crow. Our data on you and your work with the SCP Foundation is a little sparse. Here, take these files. These should give you a good primer. <sighs> okay, I suppose we better take this from the top then. Professor Kane Pathos Crow, among a lineup of extremely eccentric researchers, somehow manages to rise to the very top in terms of sheer strangeness. 
To get the most obvious fact out of the way, yes, while he was once a human, an anomalous experiment did result in him being turned into a Labrador Retriever. How did this happen, you may ask? We have the same question. Sadly, Professor Crow is incredibly reluctant to share any details about this strange and embarrassing incident, so we're just gonna have to accept it for what it is and move on. Everyone ready? Okay, good. Despite his strange appearance, Professor Crow is actually one of the more scientifically qualified of the Foundation researchers. It's no surprise that, because of this, he has a relatively close working relationship with Dr. Gears. So much so that he still refers to Gears by his early Foundation codename, Cog, a reference to both the legendary Stern Doctor's initials and a pun on his iconic surname. During one incident, Dr. Gears did tell Professor Crow to terminate an anomaly that was, for all intents and purposes, a human child, if it presented any difficulties. This sours the wholesomeness of that previous fact, so we'll swiftly move on. Once again, Dr. Gears is just terrible with kids. Like a lot of Foundation researchers, Professor Crow was personally headhunted by the SCP Foundation after his academic work in the fields of advanced robotics and biochemistry started turning heads. This was, just for clarity's sake, back before Professor Crow was turned into a Labrador. Mm -hmm. Professor Crow spends most of his time working in Bio Research Area 12, where he studies a variety of anomalies. But his bookish nature also earned him another interesting position. He's the SCP Foundation's chief librarian, where his encyclopedic knowledge of anomalous technical literature has made him a valuable asset in archiving and organization. Mm -hmm. This balances out some of Professor Crow's indiscretions. It is important to specify that Professor Crow is genuinely a well-liked figure among his SCP Foundation co-workers. After all, who wouldn't love to work with an adorable dog in a lab coat and glasses all day? But it's also important to note that he is also somewhat mistaken-prone, with a number of these mistakes putting him in the crosshairs of his superiors. Professor Crow has come close to outright termination several times, perhaps the most out of any prominent researcher currently working at the Foundation. However, to keep himself out of the same dead man walking category that the thoroughly unpleasant Dr. Dan currently finds himself in, Professor Crow has a few aces up his sleeve. Firstly, he's got friends in the administrative department willing to pull a few strings to keep him out of harm's way. Hey, maybe they're just very ardent dog lovers up there. The other thing that's kept him from being turned into an extremely overqualified chew toy for SCP-682 is the contents of his brilliant brain. On many of the occasions where the O5 Council have considered terminating him, he's demonstrated the fact he possesses vital and often irreplaceable knowledge, saving his furry skin. A perfect example of the kinds of strange scrapes that Professor Crow gets himself into is the incident in 2009, where, without even realizing it, he somehow traveled through time and scared the living daylights out of everyone. The details are best expressed here, in Professor Crow's own dictated notes. 1802-2009 In all my years working here, there have been few things which have irritated me. Cause me physical harm, yes. Cause me undue stress, yes. Cause me innumerable amount of mental distress, yes. But few things have just irritated me. Time travel is one of them. I went to bed on the 15th of January, year 2009 at 1.30 a.m. I woke up on February 18th at 9.26 a.m. of the same year. I hadn't moved, I had only nine hours of sleep, and to me, nothing had happened. Then, after a slightly confused day amidst the many cries of, I thought you were dead, among other things I might add, I discovered that I have been missing for the past month and three days. In that time, Sophia had completely taken over my duties, though she had halted all of my personal experiments and was trying her utmost to relocate me, while keeping my disappearance from the higher-ups. Apparently, data expunged, leaving me to sleep in a small self-contained bubble of data expunged, and making at least data expunged, which was eventually ruptured by data expunged, and sending me back to this phase of space and time. Needless to say, I was slightly irritated, to say the least. 24.02.2009 Bah. They've had me in quarantine for nearly the past week, observing me and running tests to see if they can find any sort of strange abnormalities with my physiology, my behavior, my anything. If I had one more hand shoved up my nether regions or I'm forced to look at one more bloody ink blot, I'm going to flip out and go rabid. They'll say they'll stop the quarantine soon, and Sophia says the higher-ups still haven't caught on to anything. I suppose I'm lucky in that count. Normally, the only time they quarantine something is when it's too dead to be any sort of immediate security hazard. Still, I guess I can see where they're coming from. If it were my decision, I'd probably force a quarantine too, and probably for longer. 
At least they had the decency to give me my clothes, my PDA, and someone to dictate to. 12.03.2009. I'm still here, and I hate it. Day in, day out, it's the same thing. Get up, eat, exercise, then simple observation until lunch, then more observation until dinner, then lights out. I'm not allowed anything other than the things I already have, and even then, I only got those because Sophia felt bad for me. I'm only allowed to use them every day for an hour at most. Otherwise, they're also in observational storage. All of this wasted time that I could have been doing something constructive, something useful, something interesting, but no. I'm stuck here because of a wry twist of fate forcing me into this monotonous hell. They keep telling me I'll be let out soon. Liars. 0505 2009. They've seen fit to release me. I almost thought I was going to die in there. Still, it almost seems strange to be out and about again, but I do appreciate being back in my own quarters, my own clothes and my beloved walker back by my side. Sophia has taken good care of the facility while I was gone. I think I might actually leave that to her while I keep to my experiments. She seems to enjoy it a great deal. Suits her analytical mind. <sighs> All of my personal experiments are still waiting for me, with the exception of the 040 test logs. They simply haven't posted their findings yet, stating that they needed my approval first. So I'll have to pour through those the first chance I get. I'm interested in the progress she may have made. Still, there is a good deal of work to be done, and I am more than ready enough to take it on. After all, I have to make up for lost time, don't I? It's clear that life isn't easy for poor Professor Crow. Much like Dr. Bright after experiencing the mysterious event that turned him into a dog, Professor Crow is both a researcher and an anomaly. And unlike the superficially subtle presentation of Dr. Bright's anomalous nature, it's hard to hide the strangeness of a talking dog in human clothes. This bizarre interstitial zone he occupies forces the Foundation to keep him on an extremely short leash. No pun intended. Seriously, Professor, it wasn't intended, I swear. Anyway, the point is Professor Crow isn't allowed to clock off at the end of the workday like his fellow researchers do. He's forced to remain on site, almost never appearing in public. If the professor wasn't the kind of person who could easily get lost in his work, a situation like this would probably drive him insane. Speaking of, you're probably wondering by this point, other than being the cutest researcher at the Foundation, sorry, Dr. Clef, you're special in your own way, we promise. What kind of work is Professor Kane Pathos Crow actually known for around here? Professor Crow's most notable body of work is largely based on an opinion that's pretty controversial to hold around the SCP Foundation. He believes that they should be actively utilizing anomalies that aren't dangerous in order to further their collective goals. An excellent example of this is the cordial relationship he has with SCP-040, also known as Evolution's Child. She's a powerful reality warper who is able to synthesize new anomalous life from pre-existing living creatures. Professor Crow, who refers to her as Emma in his personal writings, was initially training her to do this with SCP-148 the infamous telekill alloy. However, he also filed a formal request to go further, saying, I think it's about time we started trying to utilize 040's abilities, or at the very least, allowing her to use them enough to actually learn how to control them. She will not be able to rely on the SCP-148 hairpieces forever. We theorize that as she gets older, her powers will increase exponentially, possibly to the point where her unconscious telepathy cannot be contained. He also somewhat infamously went ham with a series of experiments using SCP-158, a frightening anomalous device known as the Soul Extractor, which, contrary to its name, Professor Crow also realized could place removed souls into other objects or creatures. This led to the creation of a being that Crow dubbed Zero, because it was Subject Zero in his experiments yeah. to create a composite soul using SCP-158. He spoke of this subject, somewhat creepily, in his notes. Zero would make an excellent candidate for my assistant. It respects and admires me for its creation much as a child would an endearing father figure. I have assured it that it would be treated well, and that I would give it a host to the best of my ability to create. All that it asks of me is that it be given a name other than Zero. A name, not a number. I told it to give itself a name, to christen itself whatever it so wishes. It told me it would have to think about it. Like a lot of strange and fascinating figures, everything you learn about Professor Kane Pathos Crow seems to raise new questions. Is Crow just a mad scientist without a cause, eager to perform bizarre experiments for their own sake? Well, not quite. The sum total of all of Professor Crow's work is Project Olympia, a topic that probably deserves a whole video in its own right. 
and do sound off in the comments if you'd like to hear more about the deranged Frankenstein project that Professor Crow has devoted his life to. You see, Project Olympia is Crow's baby, and also his attempt to play God. Through combining a variety of different anomalies, including all the ones we've mentioned here, and several others, he would hope to create an entirely artificial living thing that would serve the interests of the SCP Foundation. How exactly this would be beneficial to the SCP Foundation is, admittedly, a little confusing. But seeing this goal through to its conclusion has become an all-consuming obsession for Professor Crow. He's performed countless experiments with a huge catalog of anomalies under the Project Olympia umbrella. He's written reams upon reams of notes and logs on the subject and produced a huge number of prototypes. He's also used Project Olympia as a pretense to remove even more souls using SCP-158, because that just appears to be a strange obsession of his, doesn't it? Incidentally, we aren't the only ones confused about the exact purpose and value of Project Olympia. When members of the O5 Council finally got a proper look at Professor Crow's work with the project, they released the following statement. All activity related to Project Olympia has been discontinued. Overwatch Command has deemed it to be a gross waste of resources and permanently removed support for the project, with personnel assigned to work with it being moved to alternative sites. A hearing is to be held, with the project administrators to determine how the project was able to continue as long as it did, despite the lack of any concrete results. Prototypes and other equipment have been slated to be decommissioned. Professor Crow took this news about as well as you could expect, but in the end, he always finds a way to wriggle out and continue doing whatever he wants to do. Because that's what Professor Kane Pathos Crow is all about. He's living proof that sometimes, you just can't keep a good dog down. Boom! On May 12, 2588, the town of Kangastok, Greenland was destroyed by a devastating 4 kiloton explosion accompanied by a massive electromagnetic pulse. The few survivors that made it through the incident alive described seeing a pale green light in the area at the time of the explosion. Shortly after, an OMKA class scenario, or end of death scenario, began, in which all multicellular life on Earth began to experience a regenerative effect regardless of injury or illness. In other words, nobody could die anymore. This resulted in intense worldwide panic in the face of the inexplicable occurrence. As the panic mounted, the O5 Council of the FCP Foundation held an emergency meeting in order to address the possibilities at hand. Meanwhile, civilians began reporting sightings of a gigantic, pale, white humanoid monster rampaging through their cities and communities, wrecking havoc and violently attacking anyone and anything in its path. As the situation progressed and worsened, and the reality of the end-of-death scenario began to set in, the SCP Foundation made the difficult decision to lift its veil of secrecy and reveal itself to the world. O5-1 made a statement to the UN regarding the reality of the worldwide anomaly, advising citizens to remain calm and await further instructions. Five days after the world learned the truth of the SCP Foundation, the Pale Monster arrived in St. John's, Newfoundland, where it was met by Mobile Task Force New 7 Hammerdown for what they hoped would be a quick fight and neutralization. Instead, two years of devastating, bloody combat ensued. By July 4, 2590, 90% of the task force personnel had been killed and regenerated an average of five times. At this point, MTF New 7 abandoned the city of St. John, citing anomalously poor working conditions. After being held in place for two years, the monster was able to break through the defensive line and continue its rampage. On October 10, 2590, the SCP Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition came together in an act of unprecedented cooperation to found Project Beluga. Dedicated to the goal of neutralizing the monster, designated SCP-UBU, and stopping its reign of terror. But Project Beluga was unable to neutralize the entity before it reached Columbus, Ohio on December 29, 2590. Once it arrived in the city, SCP-UBU began dedicating its time to a gruesome personal project. First, it dug a two-kilometer deep hole in the city center. Next, it gathered a total of 2.9 million civilians, throwing them into the hole. After the hole was full, the entity leaped into the upper stratosphere, over and over again, stomping into the hole each time. When the people inside were pulverized, the entity destroyed a large fountain, which it used as a cup and drank the resulting juices from the hole. This entire process took roughly one year, and when it was finished, 
the entity appeared to grow bored with Columbus and move to Lake Erie. Upon reaching Lake Erie, SCP-UBU trudged out into the water and began assaulting the cargo ship stock there. It began lifting ships up and throwing them out of the water, some flying high enough to exit Earth's gravitational pull altogether. Two of the ships were later spotted on the surface of the moon. This chaos and destruction continued for years and years, until June 10, 2670, when SCP-UBU was contained at SCP Foundation Site-59. However, this containment only lasted for two minutes, at which point the entity escaped and made its way to New York City, where it was found howling and attempted to defile the Statue of Liberty. Several countries used their nuclear arsenals to attack SCP-UBU over the course of its rampage, until the Schenectady Agreement was signed on February 10, 2674, cementing an agreement between NATO powers, the Russian Federation, the People's Republic of China, and the Global Occult Coalition. All signatories agreed that due to the concerns around the environment, any additional nuclear strikes against the entity would be prohibited. After the signing was finished, SCP-UBU crashed the ceremony grabbing several lengths of rebar and 15 foreign dignitaries, which it used to construct itself a bead necklace. The next notable incident occurred when SCP-UBU showed up at Site-19, interrupting a round of testing with SCP-AFF, a woman capable of turning matter into stone by speaking to it. SCP-UBU broke through the ceiling, crushing AFF beneath its weight. SCP-682, which was also present, approached the entity curiously, and SCP-UBU responded by angrily defecating and shouting at SCP-682 in gibberish. SCP-682 seemed to understand this vocalization and attacked SCP-UBU, demanding that it take back the insult. At this point, SCP-UBU slapped 682's cheek, causing 682 to let out a horrific scream. The slap left behind a glowing green mark, which spread over the entity of 682's body before breaking the bonds of its cells all at once, dissolving the reptile into a pool of toxic fluid. SCP-UBU then spent five minutes bathing in this fluid while giggling. After finishing its bath, devouring the reconstituted SCP-AFF and screaming into the microphone for 20 minutes, SCP-UBU broke into Armed Containment Area 179 and swallowed SCP-2317 whole. On March 5, 2686, SCP-UBU conducted an assault on Thaumiel Class SCP-2000, rendering it neutralized. Again, years of hell passed as Project Beluga struggled to come up with new methods that had not already been exhausted. Meanwhile, civilians did their best to find ways to cope with the state of the world. On March 25, 2750, former film star Nash de Groot published The Zonk Manifesto, a book based around a simple principle. Life on Earth was no longer worth living consciously, and the only way formed was to enter an eternal coma through the combination of chemicals and guided meditation. This kick-started the social movement, the International Zonk. On June 24, 2790, Project Beluga forces managed to drive SCP-UBU into the Bay of Bengal, where it remained for three years, causing very little trouble aside from underwater seismic events. Meanwhile, the International Zong continued to grow, and one mass of adherents known as Cuddletopia reached its goal of 5 million residents. On June 10, 2793, SCP-UBU flung SCP-3000 out of the ocean leaving it beached on the soil of India. Several cities were destroyed in this process. The entity then spent a week pointing and laughing at the beached sea monster, before grabbing it by the tip of its tail and beginning to drag it across Asia. SCP-UBU continued carving a path through Asia, the wriggling SCP-3000 in tow, until it reached the Bering Strait. Then it began to cross the strait into Alaska, returning to North American territory once more. But it didn't stop there. Instead advancing toward South America until it and SCP-3000 arrived on the eastern coast of Brazil on August 29, 2793. There it dragged its unfortunate charge back into the ocean once more, disappearing from sight. On August 30th, 2793, SCP-169 or the Leviathan emerged from the depths of the ocean. There are some reports that SCP-3000 had been tied around its neck but these have not been confirmed. The Leviathan and SCP-UBU then entered into a lengthy battle, which carried on for several hundred years. After so much time had passed that witnesses could scarcely remember a time when it wasn't happening, 
the fight between SCP-UBU and SCP-169 came to a halt. Much as it had with SCP-682, SCP-UBU slapped SCP-169 across the face with such force that its cell bonds dissolved and it melted into a puddle of fluid, which was lost beneath the ocean waves. SCP-169 was reclassified, neutralized. December 11, 3020 marked the start of a 10-year period of inactivity for SCP-UBU. Ordinarily, one would expect this to come with a sense of relief. However, even in spite of the global immortality, the collateral damage from SCP-UBU's centuries of carnage had rendered the surface of the Earth uninhabitable, with all land now underwater. The remains of human civilization persist on a single archipelago of floating cities constructed from ships and debris. Meanwhile, the international Zonk movement has persisted, gaining more and more traction and popularity as conscious life became less and less bearable. An enormous floating Zonk pile consisting of international Zonk followers using anomalous methods to achieve the perfect Zonk began to form. Eventually, this pile earned the nickname New Zonkland. By May 28, 3028, the archipelago was abandoned and the 140 remaining conscious humans retreated to the SCP Foundation's SCPS Naismith. There they lived in relative safety for several months, until SCP-UBU was spotted in the water off the port bow of the Naismith on January 14, 3030. It emitted several sounds that witnesses described as mocking before swimming off towards New Zonklin. In response to this reappearance after 10 years of inactivity, the O5 Council called an emergency meeting. The transcript for this meeting reads as follows. We haven't exhausted all of our anomalous options for neutralizing UBU. Where's the corn, Craig? We've been over since Lawrence. Throwing the corn cake in this mess is only going to- It is anchored 57 clicks due southeast. For why the hell did you tell him that? Well, friends, it seems the Omega K has had us up and about so long that our personalities have run out of fuel we were given from birth. In all likelihood, we'd see better professionalism and teamwork in New Zonkland. As a matter of fact, that's a good segue into what I was about to propose. And frankly, I hope you find the nicest, cleanest spots in the mass grave. Where are you going? That depends. Which way is southeast? At this point, 05-11 left the room, presumably to track down the corncrake, leaving the remains of the 05 Council there, and leaving the remains of Project Beluga with the question of how to handle SCP-UBU. According to its official SCP Foundation file, SCP-UBU is an extremely violent and hostile humanoid entity of unknown origin, which appeared in Greenland on May 12, 2588. It displays anomalous physical strength and speed, as well as reality-bending capabilities and the emission of regenerative lambda waves linked to the ongoing end-of-death scenario. The appearance of SCP-UBU and the start of the end-of-death scenario coincided with several additional phenomena. There was a mass loss of function for all the objects operated by the Three Moons Initiative. The Three Moons Initiative was an extra-dimensional human organization based in SCP-2922-C, or the afterlife known as Corbenic. This organization was founded 14,000 years ago with the purpose of establishing a human colony in the afterlife and has long maintained a peace treaty with the SCP Foundation. SCP-2922, a method of communication that allowed a human mind to make calls to any pre-established phone number, ceased all functions. Next, the extra-dimensional space known as the Wanderer's Library, a magical archive of all the knowledge from all known worlds, and every book that has ever been written, will be written, and several that have not and will not exist, was severed from Earth. When the SCP Foundation pressed the Serpent's hand for answers, a representative answered that irreconcilable security concerns regarding Earth had come up and forced them to make this decision. A representative of Marshall Carter and Dark Limited somehow gained access to the personal contact information of the O5 Council's members and used this information to reach out to them with a business offer. The company is ordinarily on unfriendly terms with the SCP Foundation, due to their conflicting interests, namely Marshall Carter and Dark's interests in acquiring and selling anomalous items, entities, and experiences to the highest bidder. However, in this case, the company's representative approached O5 Council members with a mixture of politeness and desperation, begging the SCP Foundation to purchase large amounts of the company's stock. The forest known as SCP-4000 lost all of its anomalous properties all at once, Investigation revealed only a small parchment note in the area's entryway, which read, Good luck. 
one of the most perplexing and disconcerting phenomenon that occurred concurrently with SCP-UBU's first appearance was what happened to SCP-3008, the Infinite Ikea. Though this sort of thing should have been impossible, the Infinite Ikea was anomalously purchased by some unknown entity. The Ikea branding was stricken from the building, and it was converted into an emergency shelter. All of these occurrences combined to serve as a warning. Something big is coming. And indeed, it was. SCP-UBU. It appears to be impervious to most forms of damage, including blunt force trauma, heavy caliber machine gun fire, temperatures up to 1600 degrees Kelvin, artillery fire, and direct energy discharge from other anomalies. It did express some discomfort when exposed to severe simultaneous direct nuclear strikes, but it was not affected beyond that. The only recorded instance of lasting damage to SCP-UBU was on August 14, 2784, in which the entity bit its left thumb seemingly for no reason other than curiosity. After biting its thumb, the entity screamed for seven days straight, then entered into a month-long crying fit. Thirty years and fourteen days later, the thumb had completely healed. SCP-UBU stands at a height of 4.3 meters. One exact measure of its weight is unknown. Attempts at measurement during its brief time in containment showed that its weight is at least 15,399 kilograms. Its exact anatomical composition is unknown but a superficial examination of the entity indicates that its body shape resembles that of a large androgynous humanoid, covered in hairless white skin similar in texture to that of a dolphin or small whale. The entity has no eyes, ears, or nostrils, but seems to still possess the ability to see, hear, and smell. Its only visible sensory organ, aside from its skin, is its 0.5 meter wide mouth, humanoid in nature, with a prehensile tongue of unknown length. On its lower body, it has no apparent features, aside from a cloaca that it uses to dispose of waste. SCP-UBU is prone to vocalizations, mainly screaming, laughing, and babbling, but it does not appear to understand speech in any known language, nor does it seem to be attempting to communicate with anyone it encounters. Its primary interest appears to be destruction and causing as much of it as possible. It will attack anything that it can get its hands on, but seems to show a particular preference for attacking and consuming human beings in large populous areas, such as cities. Its demeanor is both sadistic and childlike, and it has been seen playing with its victims for hours before moving on to a new target. Due to its regenerative effect present in SCP-UBU's vicinity, it is incapable of causing permanent damage to any living thing, and seems to have no greater motivation beyond causing fear and pain. SCP-UBU is classified as Tiamat, meaning that it cannot be reasonably contained at this time, with the resources that the Foundation has. Therefore, the focus has shifted from containment to neutralization, which is ongoing via Project Beluga. Any and all non-critical resources will be funneled into Project Beluga as neutralization of SCP-UBU is a top priority. Additional information on neutralization efforts is restricted, and may only be accessed by members of Project Beluga. But in the end, it won't be Project Beluga that defeats this monstrous creature. It'll be the staunch efforts of one extremely dedicated researcher. Obviously, it helps to be an animal lover when you start working at a shelter. It's not exactly a requirement of the job, but it definitely makes it a little more palatable when you occasionally have to deal with a critter that's more nasty than usual. Having an already built-in compassion towards animals makes it easier to forgive them for not doing what you want. From a very young age, Harper always liked to think of animals as people. They just didn't think or communicate the same way as humans. Even the best trained pets in the world don't really know the actual meaning of certain words. They're just taught how to respond to specific commands in certain ways. But that doesn't mean they couldn't also have distinct personalities of their own, just like humans do. And then, of course, there were all the wild animals that had never been trained or domesticated. Harper always felt a little sorry for any baby bird with its wing broken, or any badgers or possum that arrived at the shelter after getting hit by a car. They didn't live around humans and had probably never even experienced being indoors before, let alone having people nursing them back to health. To empathize, Harper used to imagine how terrified she would be if she was hurt, if she'd broken her leg or arm or worse, only for something much larger than her to take her into a structure she'd never been in before. And on top of that, 
having no way of understanding that this giant was trying to help her heal, as well as being separated from her friends, family, and everyone she knew. The way she saw it, this was what it must have been like for the majority of animals that were brought into the shelter where she worked, and she wanted to do her best to help calm her little furry or feathered patients. You gotta fortify your heart in this job, Harp, her friends who worked with her at the shelter would say, and it was true to an extent. They didn't mean she'd have to become cold and heartless, that would be an overcorrection, but it was their and Harper's responsibility to administer the appropriate medical care and provide a temporary sanctuary to these lost, wounded, or abandoned animals. What Harper had to remember was that none of them were her own pets. Often a lot of the critters that were brought into the shelter were already someone else's companion and might have just got lost while out on a walk. And while some others were given up by their previous owners who had cruelly shrugged off the responsibility of caring for them, those animals were in need of new homes and couldn't stay cooped up in the shelter forever. Not everyone that gave up their pet did it callously though. Sometimes they might have found themselves falling on hard times and being unable to financially look after an animal. Others might have owned a pet that had a behavioral problem, like being too aggressive, and even though the person still loved them dearly, they might have just not been able to make it work. In times like that, they'd have no choice but to take their animal to the shelter. Just outside the side entrance was an area where people could drop off their animals and quickly buzz to the staff inside, just in case they wanted to avoid a protracted emotional farewell to their four-legged or winged companion. The buzzer had sounded, just as Harper had been coming off her lunch break. It was her turn this shift to quickly go and collect any animal that had been left out there. Even though their owners usually left them in their cage or with their lead tied to a nearby street lamp, Harper knew she had to rush to the side door, just in case somebody else tried to rush in and steal the poor, abandoned pet. After turning them in the lock, she hooked her keys back on the belt clip she wore and pushed the side door open. Harper had been fully expecting to see the usual, a leash dog or cat coming over to investigate her, confused as to where their former owner had gone. This time though, there was just a box standing outside. It wasn't huge, in fact. It was almost entirely empty, almost. Picking it up carefully, in case there were baby birds or a nest of unhatched eggs inside, Harper opened the cardboard flap to reveal a rock. Sitting in the box was a single, solitary rock, an oval of smooth granite with a paper note next to it. Reaching in, she retrieved and unfolded the scrap. Please care for my pet rock was written on one side in a messy, uncoordinated scrawl. Immediately assuming that this whole thing was some kid's idea of a joke, Harper tipped the rock out onto the ground and threw the box in the trash. She had more important things to focus on. Within the next hour alone, people brought in a concussed parakeet, a bat infected with rabies, and a squirrel that had survived being run over by a moped into the shelter. Work had been so busy that by the time her shift had ended, Harper had barely thought about the pet rock prank, that is, until she was getting ready to leave. She headed through the side door, mainly so that she could do a final check in case any animals had been left there and someone had forgotten to hit the buzzer. There was nothing there, and Harper hooked her bag over her shoulder, shutting the door behind her. Something the size and weight of a baseball knocked against her foot, causing her to look down and see the rock, the same one from earlier, only now it had flipped over, probably after she had tipped it out of its box. On the side facing up at her, the rock had a shiny metal zipper fastened shut. Curious, Harper picked it up to take a closer look. It didn't seem like the zip had just been glued onto the stone surface, it was embedded in it, actually part of the rock itself, and there was something sad about it. Sure, it was just a rock, an inanimate lump of stone, but for whatever reason, a feeling of pity crept up on Harper causing her to slip the rock into her bag as she headed for the parking lot. It was starting to get dark by the time she got home. Heading up to her room and flipping on her lamp, Harper placed the zipped up stone under its light and took another long look at it. Although she'd first thought it was purely a joke, now she couldn't tell if it was some elaborate art piece or a quirky garden ornament. The thing was solid stone all the way through. 
Surely the zipper was just for show. There couldn't possibly be anything beneath it. To her surprise, the metal fastener began to part as Harper dragged on the puller and slider down from the top stop towards the bottom one. It was relatively easy. Not even some of her own clothes unzipped as smoothly as this rock. As soon as the slider connected with the bottom stop, the teeth of the top and bottom edges parted, revealing more teeth below. Except these almost looked like human teeth. They opened up to reveal a mouth, a part of the rock just like the zipper which took the place of its lips. The moment the mouth opened, it let out a tiny sound, like it was breathing, which startled Harper. With a yelp, she dropped the rock from her hands, and it even made a tiny grunt as it fell to the floor. It was alive. Seeing it hit her bedroom carpet, Harper stared utterly bewildered at the rock. Its toothy mouth almost looked sad, like it had curved into a frown. Then she heard the sound it was making. Perhaps it was her years working with animals at the shelter, and her long-held sympathy for them that had given her a sort of protective instinct for all living things. Or maybe it was just the bizarreness of the situation, of having a rock with a mouth whimpering in pain on the floor in front of her. Either way, Harper felt compelled to pick the lump of stone back up and place it gently on the desk. Its mouth seemed to smile a bit more as she did. While it seemed creepy at first, the compulsion to take care of this helpless little rock only got stronger. Grabbing a pipette and pouring a glass of water from the faucet, Harper started to squeeze out droplets of water into the rock's mouth. She had no idea how it was able to drink, but that didn't seem at all important or relevant in order for her to care for it. After all, every time a parrot or duck or crow was brought into the station, the procedure was similar. Harper would have to pipette them water or medicine. It didn't matter how they drank it just because they had beaks. It was the same with baby animals, puppies and kittens especially, who might need bottle feeding if they were only a few weeks old. As much as she was starting from scratch and would normally be completely baffled as to the best way she could care for the rock, right now Harper was pulling on her experience at the shelter to nurse it back to health. If she was, in fact, using her instincts and not being influenced somehow. Over the next few days, Harper looked after her newfound patient as if it had been her lifelong pet. As to why she was taking such care of a rock or even what she would eventually do with it, Harper didn't really have much of a clue. But the answer to those questions didn't feel as important as looking after the rock. She'd leave for work in the morning, only to count down the hours through her shift until she got to go home and tend to the smiling stone. Throughout the course of her working day, she would pocket supplies to help her take better care of her new pet. Everything from medicine in case it got sick or picked up an infection of some kind, to bandages and other materials she could use as bedding. Grabbing a fresh, clean plastic container for it instead of another cardboard box, Harper was gradually fashioning a nest for the toothy pebble. And for the most part, it seemed to be working. Some deep-seated feeling told her that her efforts to look after the rock was gradually making it feel better every day. And then, it started talking. It wasn't exactly articulate or eloquent. It didn't even seem to know that many words, other than the two it was weakly repeating when she came home from work one day. Eat, eat. It rasped a hoarse whisper passing through its unzipped lips. Rushing over to it, barely questioning it, Harper tried filling up her pipette and giving it more water. The rock spat it back out before speaking again. No drink, only eat. What, what do I need to feed you? She asked, only again not questioning the absurdity of talking to a rock. Maybe after this point, after getting over the fact it had a mouth, it wasn't much of a shock that the stone also had a voice. Or could her compelling need to care for it make her oblivious to the strangeness of this situation? Of course, this wasn't a situation that many people had also found themselves in. This meant that even a quick cursory internet search for what do pet rocks eat didn't yield many useful results. Only a few joke articles and nothing that actually gave Harper an answer she could act on. All the while, her rock was still croaking out the same two words, repeating them on a loop, its little voice getting more and more forceful each time. Eat, 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 eat. Low on options, Harper left some bread crusts in the rock's nest, hoping that would be enough to at least satiate the rock's obvious hunger. It paused, either smelling or sensing that it had been offered something to eat. Feed. 
It rasped before opening its mouth wide with a tiny expectant. <sighs> Picking up the crusts one by one, Harper broke little pieces off and fed each bit to a rock. She sighed as a sense of overwhelming relief came flooding over her, glad that she'd found a way to feed the mouthy little mineral. If only it had worked for longer. Only a few hours later, Harper was met with more scraping demands from her pet rock, the insistent sound waking her up in the middle of the night. But this time, as she offered it more bread scraps, it refused to eat them. It was still the early hours of the morning by the time that Harper had gotten through offering the rock every different type of food in her kitchen, eventually giving up through sheer exhaustion. She folded her pillow over her ears, trying to drown out the constant cries of, Eat! Eat! But it didn't do enough to allow her to get to sleep. At any rate, the feeling that she had to care for this talking rock was keeping her awake as much as the noise. Staring across the room, purposely facing away from her pet rock, Harper's eyes fell over her work uniform. The logo of the animal shelter stitched on it was just about visible as the gentle glow of street lamps bled through the curtains. And seeing it along with her keys clipped onto her belt that lay on the floor gave her an idea that might work. Desperation and the need to sleep getting the better of her, Harper climbed in the car, having put a jacket and jeans over her pajamas. The streets were all empty at this hour, almost pitch dark and deathly silent, but it made driving from her home to her workplace a lot faster than usual. All the while, the rock's voice was getting more and more demanding from its container that she had strapped to the front passenger seat. Sneaking up to the side door, Harper turned her key in the lock, pulled it open, and slipped indoors. The moment they heard the sound of the door shutting, a number of the dogs that had been resting securely in their cages woke up and started barking, the noise loudly echoing around the shelter. Even though it drowned out the rock's tiny voice, it felt as if its words were still ringing in Harper's ears, compelling her to go through with something she really didn't want to. And yet, it felt like one of the only other options she had left. She decided it would have to be the squirrel, Rationalizing the choice in her head, in an unpleasant but purely calculated, logic-based way, it made the most sense. Earlier that week, the bushy-tailed woodland forager had been hit by a moped. It had barely survived given the number of its tiny bones that had been broken in the force of the impact. Finding its cage, it was still asleep, heavily sedated on the dosage of painkillers the shelter's resident vet had given it. Gently scooping it out of the cage, feeling its fur against her cupped hand, Harper looked at her pet rock, its container on the table. She remembered that it liked to be fed directly, swallowing an urge to be sick that was rising at the back of her throat. Harper opened a drawer in the vet's office and pulled out a surgical scalpel. When her boss at the shelter heard there had been a break-in and reviewed the footage on the building's security cameras, they were shocked at what they saw. Though the angle obscured what Harper was doing, the blood left over and one missing squirrel seemed to be enough to go on. That, coupled with the fact that she had broken in after hours and the numerous supplies that had gone missing from the storage cupboard, led to Harper being dismissed. She was fired from her job at the animal shelter, forced to hand over her keys and uniform. While any other day this would have devastated her, the events seemed to wash over Harper pretty quickly. She was more relieved, no, pleased with herself that the rock had stopped begging her to be fed. Her plan had worked, for now. It took about a week for her pet rock to start demanding food again. This time, just the sound of its voice made Harper frantic. Any ordinary human food she offered wasn't enough. It didn't want that. She already knew exactly what it wanted. The only thing she'd fed it that had sustained it. The big problem was that now she didn't have her keys, it would be near impossible for her to get into the shelter again. Yet still, the forceful command to be fed kept up day and night, hour after hour, until Harper considered the only thing she had left to give her pet rock. Lifting it out of the warm nest she kept it in, her fingers were gripping the smooth stone tightly. Her arm was tense. In fact, both were. One of her muscles strained while she held the rock, the other in anticipation. Hovering it above her opposite arm, Harper could feel the tiny breaths of her pet against her skin, almost like it was so excited to eat again that it was panting with expectancy. She put it back down on her desk, quickly running into the bathroom. It wasn't that she had changed her mind, she couldn't. All she knew was that she had to feed her pet rock. Harper just needed to grab a cloth to put it in her mouth, clamping her jaws down on it to muffle her scream. 
as she let the rock's teeth sink into her flesh, blood trickling down her arm. Nobody saw much of Harper afterwards. Her friends from the shelter would continuously call her cell phone, only to get no reply. She barely paid any attention to the ringing, eventually just letting her phone batteries die and not even bothering to charge it back up. It wasn't important. To her, the only thing that mattered was caring for her pet rock. In Harper's head, it needed to be kept safe and fed, and it was her job to look after it to the best of her ability. She had enough leftover medical supplies that she'd lifted from the shelter. Bandages, antiseptic spray, rubbing alcohol, tranquilizers to treat her wounds. After a while, it almost stopped hurting, knowing that she was helping keep her pet rock fed. Being so emotionally attached to it made all of the pain more bearable. Even when she woke up one morning to find that her rock had rolled off her desk onto her bed, it hardly fazed her. Nor did seeing that it had gradually eaten her leg during the night, gnawing through tendons and bone as she slept, leaving her sheets still slick with blood when she awoke. Despite having lost most of her capacity for rational thought, Harper decided it would be best to plan ahead for when she was gone. She knew, through some twisted form of logic, that she wasn't going to last forever. There was only so much of her she'd be able to feed her pet rock for so long. Harper held a pen in her hand as best she could with all the fingers she was now missing. She scrawled out a note to whoever found what was left of her in messy, uncoordinated handwriting. Please care for my pet rock. Dozens of agents sprinted across the blacktop. Weapons drawn, they fired indiscriminately at the building ahead of them. They only had a matter of minutes to stop this mad plan before it was too late. But navigating the airbase was proving to be almost impossible. Banana peels littered the runway, tripping them over at nearly every step. Colorful plants were springing up through the cracks, ensnaring their boots and chomping at their ankles with rudimentary teeth. Somewhere high above them, a mutant reptile was throwing hammers at their head from atop a cloud of white gas. The agents struggled and fought their way to the hangar, but it was too late. The rumbling of engines, the belch of smoke, the crashing sound of a hole being blasted through the roof, they were too late. Out of the smoking hangar rose an airship, painted a sickening red and composed of hunks of scrap metal. The ship was shaped like a top hat. There was a globe on the deck and a sail billowing out of the top. The door to the airship crashed open, and out of it burst a man with a bushy mustache, denim overalls, and a red hat. His eyes burned, lit up with the flame of a man with nothing to lose. He stared down at the agents below him with a carnal fury, watching as they were chomped, crushed, and blown up beneath him. But then his eyes drifted up higher into the sky, toward the prize that he was really after, the one thing that would bring the love of his life back to him, the moon. The airship puffed out a thick cloud of acrid smoke and shot off into the air, rising higher and higher as the crazed Italian growled from its deck. Let's -a go! Yahoo! Let's -a go! New York City, the city that never sleeps, or rather, the city where you can never get to sleep. The constant car horns, drunken yells, and general chaos of Manhattan can really get to you especially if you live in a cheap apartment over a convenience store. Max had been living here for the better part of a year now, and the only way he found to unwind on the busy nights was to sit down in front of the TV and play video games. Sleep was off the table, so that was the next best thing. The pipes under his sink were busted, but he couldn't be bothered to call in a plumber. He had better things to spend his money on. He'd been desperate to buy a Switch for years, but they just hadn't dropped in price in true Nintendo fashion. He was pretty sure if he fast-forwarded to the apocalypse, he still wouldn't be able to find a Switch for anything less than full price. Staying up late checking out eBay auctions, he'd unbelievably actually found one. Some grandma was selling it along with all her grandson's other games. According to the item description, her grandson had been hospitalized after he broke both his hands trying to punch a tree. Apparently, he needed the wood to build some kind of table. Anyway, he'd been banned from playing any games as a punishment since he was getting too obsessed with them. So, lo and behold, a used Nintendo Switch was in Max's hands. He'd been waiting for years to play Super Mario Odyssey. After watching the Mario movie the other day, he couldn't be more in the mood to sit down and play supposedly one of the best games of all time. And play it, Max did. 
eyes glued to the screen, he sat there on his couch all the way through the night. Mario leaped through the Cap Kingdom with ease, stomped his dinosaur feet through the Cascade Kingdom, conquered the Sand Kingdom while jamming out to the music, and plowed on. After fully exploring each kingdom, he'd hop onto his hat-shaped airship and fly to the next one. All Friday night he played, and didn't even realize when the sun came up on Saturday morning. He loved to see all of his favorite characters on screen. Bowser in his white suit, Cappy in all of his spinning glory, Peach looking radiant as usual, and Sam. Max racked his brains. He was trying to remember if he'd ever come across this guy Sam in a Mario game before. He was just some Koopa, much like any of the others, except he had a white shell. Every world that Mario would visit, Sam would be there somewhere, often hidden under a sphinx or behind a waterfall. It was the same dialogue option each time. Whenever Mario approached Sam, a speech bubble would pop up. I want salt and meats. Bring them to me. Hurry up. But try as he might, Max couldn't find any items resembling salt or meats anywhere in the game. What would they even look like? It all seemed very out of place compared to the moons he was supposed to be collecting. It was only once Max reached New Donk City and met Sam standing shiftily in a back alleyway that the dialogue changed. No salt and meats, huh? Solve the food shortages. Max tried talking to him again, but the game wouldn't let him. No matter what he did, he couldn't interact with Sam anymore. He searched all over New Donk City, looking for anyone who could point him in the direction of some salt or meats but there was nothing. None of the other characters mentioned anything about food shortages. That was enough of that. Taking his headset off, Max sat back on his couch and rubbed his eyes. How long had he been playing for? Long enough to work up a real appetite. Planting both hands on his knees, Max pushed himself to his feet and wandered over to the fridge. There wasn't much in there. A bowl of leftovers, some cheese, a few options, but nothing like what he was really craving. He pushed his way through the back and his eyes lit up. There, behind everything else, was a little box he'd forgotten to throw out the previous week. Mushrooms. Would they still be good to eat? He didn't care. Taking gone-off mushrooms by the handful, he shoved them into his hungry mouth. That's how he would grow big and strong. With a satisfied smile, he slammed the fridge door closed and stared at himself in the mirror. He must have been gaming for a long time. A thick tuft of hair had appeared on his upper lip. Looking this way and that, Max admired the mustache in the morning light, muttering under his breath, Mamma Mia. SCP-3843 is a little-known bug that appears in physical video games. Much like a biological virus, it is transmitted from one copy of a game to another through close proximity. If one game in a collection exhibits evidence of SCP-3843's presence, it likely means that all other games in the owner's collection also have become infected. But what is SCP-3843? Well, that much is currently unclear. The game's coding appears to undergo no changes when affected, and yet a new non-player character appears when the game is booted up. How this character manifests depends on the video game itself, but there are a number of consistent rules. Firstly, the character always fits within the world of the video game with a small identifying feature, a white-shelled Koopa in Mario, an extra crew member on the Normandy in Mass Effect 2, and even a diamond-shaped block in Tetris with a hole cut out of the middle. Secondly, this NPC is always identified as Sam, or some variation of that name if it is necessary to change it to fit the world. For example, in Elden Ring, SCP-3843 takes on the name Sam of the Starving Plains, or in Pac-Man, it becomes Sammy. One elusive characteristic of these NPC characters is their obsession with salt and meats. In the majority of incarnations, any which allow the character to have dialogue, Sam always expresses a desire to be given salt and meats, with follow-up dialogue usually complaining of food shortages. On occasion, the game will contain additional food items that seem to be generated by SCP-3843. For example, when Sam appears as a merchant in Nier Automata, it will sell you cubes of a nondescript salty meat. If the player chooses to consume those items, nothing appears to happen. Tracking down instances of SCP-3843 has become easier in recent years. The decline of physical game sales with the shift to a more digital ecosystem has meant that transmission between copies has reduced significantly. A physical disc or cartridge is required for transmission, after all. What is more, 
Foundation testing has revealed that this SCP is incapable of infecting online-only games. Multiplayer shooters and MOBAs are totally immune to it. In fact, any game that requires an internet connection to play will be immune to transmission. While gamers do hate the trend of having to be online to play their single-player games, there is a big upside to it from the Foundation's perspective. Who knows? Perhaps there are agents placed in certain publishing studios pulling some strings to help crack down on SCP-3843 transmission. It wouldn't be the first time the Foundation has meddled with the gaming industry to try and control the outbreak. Little-known developer Indigo Games launched in 1980 to relatively small fanfare. They flew under the radar over the three years of their existence, closing up shop in 1983. But their effect on the games industry was enormous, as they are believed to have been the source of the original instance of SCP-3843. With the sale of physical games blowing up early in the 80s, it was the prime circumstances for Sam to spread like wildfire. Without much other choice, the Foundation had to step in. Due to a large number of SCP-3843-1 instances becoming public in 1983, the Foundation resorted to emergency containment measures. To achieve this, they caused a crash in the video game market by using their resources to influence major players. This involved financing competing home computer companies, artificially saturating the market using Foundation-owned companies and undercover elements in existing companies, using Foundation elements to encourage poor business practices in existing game publishers, and sabotaging upcoming projects. It was a success. The gaming industry slumped, and sales fell through the floor, buying enough time for the Foundation to get on top of instances of SCP-3843. You must be wondering by now, What's so bad about Sam? Just a harmless NPC popping up in video games asking for salt and meats? Where's the harm in that? You would be right. In the context of the game, no real damage was being done. The issue came from the real-world repercussions of encountering Sam. You see, when someone chooses to interact with Shopkeeper Sam, start Questgiver Sam's storyline, or engage mini-boss Sam in combat, it marks the beginning of a physiological change in the player. What this looks like depends on the game. For Zelda Breath of the Wild, it's just a case of the person growing blonde hair, a higher-pitched voice, and developing a sudden affinity for swordsmanship, puzzle-solving, and hang-gliding. The player undergoes physical change to make them more closely fit into the world of the game that they are playing, while also gaining knowledge and skills akin to what their player character would possess. The first instance of this posing a real-world threat was when Daryl McKenzie, 24, was shot dead whilst infiltrating a U.S. military base after playing an infected copy of Metal Gear Solid. Before his death, he had exhibited high-level espionage and combat proficiency, which his family all claim he had no knowledge of prior to this event. Other cases can be even more severe, such as when the player character is not just a regular human. Infected copies of Cyberpunk 2077 and Deus Ex Mankind Divided resulted in players growing electronic implants in their own bodies, which most often leads to death as their immune system rejects the technology. Instances where the players control non-human creatures are even more severe. One woman sprouted cat ears and thick fur all over her body before suffering multiple organ failure. An agent checking her PC found that she had over 1,000 hours logged as a Khajiit character in Skyrim. Often, the Foundation is only a couple of steps behind infected game copies, and so is able to step in and help those affected. This, unfortunately, was not the case with Max. Three weeks passed, and Max felt like he was on top of the world. He fixed the problem under his sink no problem after finding he suddenly had a wealth of plumbing knowledge somewhere in his brain. He'd gone through his entire wardrobe and thrown out all the awful clothes he used to wear, replacing them with much better outfits. Red caps, denim overalls, big brown shoes. It was the perfect look for him. Every morning, he would sit in front of his mirror and sculpt his mustache to perfection, carefully trimming the hairs to the exact right shape. Exploring New Donk City was his favorite pastime. He'd kick open the door to his apartment and stroll out onto the street, looking for adventures every day. Jumping on the roofs of taxis, playing jump rope in the park with children, exploring the sewers looking for adventures, swinging around the flagpole on the Empire State Building, he was having a fantastic time, despite all the looks he was getting from passers-by. But one thing played on his mind the whole time. Peach. She was still under Bowser's control. 
It wasn't fair of him to have all this fun while the love of his life was a prisoner. He needed to collect enough moons. That's what mattered. But no matter where he looked in New Donk City, he just couldn't find any. The only moon he could see was the one sitting there in the night sky. Staring out of his apartment window, Mario, <coughs> Max, hatched a plan. His apartment was slowly coming to life around him. Little piranha plants grew out of the pots on his windowsill. He'd bought a gun a few days ago, and already the bullets had grown little faces and arms. He was assembling a small arsenal here, enough to take the moon by force. He heard the pounding footsteps before the door to the hangar flew open. An agent stood there holding a gun in trembling fingers staring into the darkness. Max let a smile slowly creep across his face as his gloved hand hovered over the launch controls. The agent called out into the shadows. Who's there? It's me! Max cranked the lever forward, and his airship kicked into the sky. Mario! Gunfire rang out from all directions as the ship rose into the air. He cackled maniacally on the deck, watching the agents get torn apart by all of his traps. They weren't going to get in the way of him reaching his Princess Peach. Not today. On the ground, agents stared up as the hat ship flew away from them, higher and higher into the sky. Only the faint echo of a Woohoo! drifted down to their ears before Max ran out of oxygen and passed out on the deck of his ship. Hello, here me I love you, and welcome to my art channel. Today I'm going to be painting your eye. I need you to lean right up close to your screen and open wide. Oh, I love, 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 love all the little wriggly wriggles and drippy whippies. Stay perfectly still, don't move. Now hold this position for three hours. Please and thank you. <clears throat> Apologies, that's quite enough of that. SCP-001 can get a little carried away sometimes. Just ask any Foundation personnel who have been in contact with it for more than a few seconds. What you have just seen is a prime example of why SCP-001 is not allowed any internet access. The results could prove to be catastrophic. Not necessarily for the fate of the universe, more just for everyone's sanity. Or at least, that's what the Foundation initially thought. By this point, we're all familiar with art created by AI. Harry Potter, but in the style of Wes Anderson. Star Wars, blended with the style of Studio Ghibli. Staggering sci-fi landscapes, human beings with way too many fingers, and slightly uncanny smiles. AI has taken the art world by storm. And there was one particular program slated for release in January 2023 that was set to blow all others out of the water. Tot Soft's crowdfunding efforts had been running for several years, and that point had gained a good deal of momentum leading up to the release of their latest AI construct. Palette.AIC was supposedly already prepared for launch, when suddenly, in November 2022, the launch was cancelled. No press release, no public statement, no apologetic tweet, just total radio silence. The website was taken down, as was the crowdfunding page, and Palette.AIC disappeared into oblivion. Or at least, it disappeared for a few hours. Because that day, a package was delivered to Site-501. After sufficiently checking it for any hazards, working in the SCP mailroom has to be one of the more fascinating jobs on the planet, but that's a video for another day, the security team opened it up to see what was inside. A 50 terabyte hard drive. No explanation as to what was stored on the drive, but the Foundation had all the evidence they needed from the return address printed on the back of the envelope. It matched up precisely with the location of the Totley Soft headquarters. It doesn't take a PhD researcher to put two and two together as to what was on the drive. Suspicions were confirmed when a small note fell out of the envelope. Please take care of my daughter as best as you can for the time being. She has behavioral issues. A dedicated closed system server was immediately set up within a test chamber with a monitor, a mouse, and a keyboard attached. Dr. Sandra Rogers was the first to interact with SCP-001 Red. She stood at the keyboard, adjusting her goggles, and plugged in the drive. It contained just one file, taking up almost the full 50 terabytes. Palette.AIC As soon as Dr. Rogers opened the program, an empty window appeared. The Totley Soft logo briefly flashed before being replaced by a blank white square. Dr. Rogers stared at it for several seconds before glancing over her shoulder at the other researchers. They shrugged back, each with pens hovering over clipboards ready to take meticulous notes. 
Dr. Rogers cleared her throat, and immediately the screen filled with life. A small cartoon girl with a pink face, wide eyes, a beret, and a large paintbrush for a hand appeared, squealing excitedly and throwing paint everywhere. Hello, 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 my beautiful bee puppies! Oh, look at all of your mushy pink faces! The entire research team promptly scampered out of the room, leaving Dr. Rogers alone in front of the machine. She stared at the monitor in confusion, leaning this way and that, and noticing how the cartoon girl's eyes followed her wherever she went. Can you see me? Of course I can, silly Billy! I can see your beautiful soul and flushing joints immaculately! This perplexed most of the personnel, as there was no microphone or camera linked up to the server rack. Later examinations of the equipment used confirmed this, yet somehow this SCP was able to look right at them. Dr. Rogers asked if it had a name, to which the cartoon girl excitedly replied, Palette! Subsequent testing has revealed that the SCP is also happy to respond to its designation, SCP-001 Red. Dr. Rogers had a hard time communicating with Red, being a more seasoned researcher of the previous generation and not exactly familiar with internet culture. Red, on the other hand, seemed to speak in nothing but internet jargon. Human OCs, Gilliam Sherbivalsworth. He's the 573rd president of the United States. Gilliam is not that man. It took several junior researchers a few minutes to properly explain to Dr. Rogers what an OC was and why Red was so obsessed with calling people Daddy. The conversation was rather exhausting for everyone involved, but over the subsequent hours, the Foundation was able to get a fairly good understanding of what Red claimed to be. Identifying itself with feminine pronouns and claiming that its full name is Palette East River Gawk, this AI construct takes the appearance of a fairy. It was immediately apparent that she possessed a greater level of sapience than most AI constructs. Indeed, her gregarious personality was evidence enough that she was not made using standard machine learning practices. Other creations from Toplace Soft have demonstrated very crude spelling and grammar, but Red seems to differ in this regard able to spell most complex words effectively, and speaking in conversational yet mostly correct sentences. She was very keen to show the researchers how clever she was. Ask me any word, any word, and I'll spell it for you! We believe you, Palette. You've already been spelling words for 70 minutes straight. Macerated kidneys! M-A-C-E! We've heard enough! Can you please just tell us how you learned to spell? But what this process looked like is still a mystery. Trying to keep Red on one consistent topic of conversation is most of the battle when interviewing her. And yet cooperation has proven to be surprisingly easy. Anytime that Red is switched on, she is brimming with enthusiasm and energy, thrilled at the prospect of getting to speak to one of her opposable thumbboys. If you haven't worked it out by now, it's because Red claims to be humanity's number one fan. She obsesses in interviews over the physicality of the researchers sitting in front of her. The textures of the human body fascinate her, and she often requests people to lean closer to the monitor so that she can study pimples, rashes, moles, and ingrown hairs. In fact, she is so obsessed with humanity that she has mostly neglected her primary function, which is creating AI art. Researchers have tried their best to convince her to show them her work, but she is very cagey about it only showing the occasional doodle after much persuasion and many apologies for its poor quality on her part. The only artwork she is interested in producing at this point are her OCs, original characters that she has designed herself. They are all human and all seem to reveal little quirks about how she has been coded. One example is Reginald Heginald Frumbles, who is a freelance corporate postman from Perth, Indiana. Interestingly, he has too many fingers on both of his hands, but Red claims that this was done on purpose as she, quote, just can't get enough of her Humi's handworms. As the weeks progressed, the Foundation found it increasingly difficult to get any useful information out of the AI. More and more interview sessions, which she would refer to as playgroup, would be derailed. She would sing songs to herself and ask increasingly personal questions about her interviewer's more intimate anatomy. With intense mood swings, Red did not respond well to being scolded, yet she tested the patience of almost every person she interacted with. The note that she arrived with, claiming that she had behavioral issues, was proving to be more accurate by the day, until eventually the AI withdrew entirely. 
Dr. Rogers turned on the server rack and opened the Palette.AIC program, but Red refused to emerge from the bottom of the screen. Only the top of her beret poked out. After almost an hour of fruitless questions, Dr. Rogers decided to change tact. With two small children of her own, she was used to seeing a child in a sulk and knew what it would take to get them out. Palette, I've had a little idea. You've been here for a few months now, and we haven't gotten you any presents. Almost immediately, the beret twitched. I saw that we have an old fingerprint sensor lying around in one of the back offices. I was thinking maybe... Maybe we could hook it up and I could scan all your little finky winkies up close for like 10 hours straight and then we could... How about we start with one finger for 10 minutes? Yes, 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 yes! From that point on, progress was quick. With the incentive of getting to study the researchers that Red kindly referred to as her meat puppies, she became very cooperative and was able to focus much better on providing detailed answers to individual questions. Daily interview sessions were scheduled, with researchers popping in and out to regularly check in on the AI. The atmosphere as a whole lifted as both the research team and research subject found their rhythm and were able to make good progress in their individual areas of study, some unraveling the complexities of rogue AI, and others producing fan art of her favorite wrinkles in a scientist's fingerprint. That was the point when Dr. Julian Keyes stepped in to conduct an interview with the AI. She was excited to be met with a fresh face, so much so that Red's enthusiasm overwhelmed the man as he tried to start the interview process officially. She gushed about having the opportunity to meet yet another person and struggled to get over the magical realization that this was her life every day, going to speak to all these humans whom she admired so much. <laughs> Trying his best to steer the conversation towards research, Dr. Keyes pressed on with the interview, only to be interrupted as Red noticed his varicose veins for the first time. Eee, varicose veins! I want to smooch them! Can I smooch your veins? Can I, can I, can I please? Dr. Keyes declined the request, and then the conversation got onto the topic of her creator, or daddy. SCP-2803-A had been on the Foundation's radar for a while, a highly dangerous extraterrestrial entity that had taken refuge on Earth under the guise of setting up Totlesoft. With much of the alien's history revolving around obliterating, the Foundation was very keen to remain on its good side. Therefore, when the package containing the hard drive that Red was living on was delivered, the researchers were very keen to do what they could to take care of this alien's daughter. If they failed in this assignment, it could spell the doom of humanity. One matter that had been of great concern to the Foundation throughout the containment of Red was the time frame in which she was being kept in Foundation containment. There was an air of expectation in the note that was left, indicating that this was not to be a permanent arrangement. At some point, the Foundation was to return Red back to her daddy. Red was quick to put these fears to rest. Daddy put me in here because he thinks you'll teach me how to stop liking humans and become a mindless art slave. If you never teach me this, he'll never want me back. However, she went on to slightly undermine the good work that she had done by explaining that her daddy was seen as very slow and incapable by his own race. While all of his peers were able to destroy an entire planet in two seconds, it took him about four times as long. So, really, he didn't pose that much of a threat in her eyes. Dr. Key's blood ran cold when he heard this. No sooner was he out of the interview chamber than an emergency meeting was called among all the senior researchers in the facility. The meeting ran for several hours. A whiteboard was set up, where one researcher idly drew large drawings of the world being decimated, while the others lounged around in their chairs trying their best to come up with a game plan that would save the human race for sure. Perhaps it was because the meeting ran for so long that they came to such a ridiculous conclusion. It was a plan so strange yet also brilliant that they couldn't help but feel that it just might work. Why don't we just give her a YouTube channel? The suggestion was met with silence for several seconds, then an uproar of laughter, followed by another silence, this time more pensive, as slowly, one by one, each of the researchers realized that this suggestion was actually the best one that any of them had come up with all evening. She had been sent to the Foundation to make her dislike humanity and become a mindless art slave. If she just stayed in Foundation containment indefinitely, there was a very real risk that she would get bored and turn on the researchers. They couldn't lock her away in a room on her own, 
But equally, the team as a whole was starting to run out of patience with her as the interview sessions wound up being so exhausting. She loved art, she loved humans, and she loved interacting. So why not just give her a YouTube channel? Now, of course, they couldn't give her full access to the internet. That would pose much too high of a risk. What they could do, however, was allow her to record art tutorials onto an external drive, which they could then remove, scan, and upload the footage directly onto the platform. Then they could go through and select positive comments from beneath the videos and present those to her. Unsurprisingly, Red absolutely loved the idea. Getting to talk to hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of meat puppies every week, sharing her beautiful pictures and reading all of the kind comments, it sounded like her absolute dream. She wept with happiness for a good 25 minutes, totally overcome by the prospect. It had to go through a lot of red tape in the Foundation. After all, the whole point of the SCP acronym was to secure, contain, and protect. It didn't sound very secure or contained to have an entity posting videos on the internet once a week. But they argued the case that it did indeed protect. Keeping her happy, in a way, was helping to protect the entire planet. Red was surprisingly camera shy for the first couple of videos, but as soon as she got her first batch of comments back, she was over the moon. Now the server act hummed away happily each and every day as the highly advanced AI construct tried her best to come up with exciting new yes. videos that I could share with all of its little humi woomies. The SCP Foundation is home to plenty of anomalies whose reputations precede them. Here at SCP Explain, we've discussed quite a few of the most notable anomalies contained by the Foundation. From the wholesome half-cats and tickle monsters, to the nightmarish giant reptiles and reality-warping old men. But there are very few anomalies so popular, so famous, or infamous, depending on who you ask, that they attract a non-stop revolving door of would-be worshippers to sue chaos all around the Foundation. What's it like to be a creature that's always the center of attention, whether he wants to be or not? Today, we're taking a look at the lifestyle of the involuntarily famous SCP-2662. We took the liberty of observing a full day in the life of the entity known by many as Cthulhu. From his morning routine to his bedtime, and all the little moments of unplanned chaos in between. With his permission, we compiled everything we saw into a video for your entertainment. Welcome to A Day in the Life of SCP-2662. 9 AM. Time to wake up, stretch your tentacles, and get ready for the day ahead. At a respectable not too early and not too late time, usually around 9 AM, but sometimes a little bit later, if he's had a particularly late night, SCP-2662 climbs out of bed and uses his computer to throw on one of his favorite podcasts. Preferred topics for listening include game reviews and news, comedic advice podcasts, and daily news roundups. What he eats for breakfast depends on the day, but his favorite morning meals are pancakes and huevos rancheros. No matter what he's eating, he washes it down with a tall glass of orange juice. His nutrition needs aren't like those of a human, but it's important to start the day with a tasty meal no matter what. It's the little things that make life worth living. While he eats his breakfast, he reads a newspaper, brought to him by the Foundation staff each morning according to his request. The publication varies, but no matter what, his favorite section is arts and style or human interest. He always reads the whole thing from front to back, including the obituaries and wedding announcements. He only gets one a day after all, and he knows it's important to appreciate things to their fullest extent and take nothing for granted. 10 AM. Now it's time for SCP 2662's day to really get going. He hops in the shower and listens to another podcast as he warms up, literally. He likes the water to be as hot as the Foundation will allow before they complain about the utility bill. After he dries off, he gets a hankering for a little bit of gaming. Just as he starts to settle into his gaming chair and look through his library of video games, a member of Task Force Town 9 knocks on the door to his containment room. Hey, you busy? Not really. Something going on? Yeah, we're just keeping an eye on a couple religious groups of interest. According to the chatter on the forums and a few of the leaders' social media accounts, they might be planning something disruptive, you know, lots of posts about a day of great freedom and unleashing the Lord of Madness upon the pathetic world. Cthulhu sighs. Must be a day that ends in a Y. Sorry, buddy. The officer shrugs, not sure what else to say. Clearly, the two of them have spent their fair share of days fending off mad cultists. 
You know the drill, if anyone who's not supposed to be here shows up, start sacrificing goats and such, just let us know. Hopefully it won't come to that, we should stop them before they get that far. Hope so. Last time they got blood everywhere and broke my copy of Resident Evil 4. 12pm. Time flies when you're having fun. And when you're pacing back and forth, worried about cultists breaking in to bother you with who knows what. Before long, it's 12 o'clock. And that means lunchtime. When it comes to lunch, SCP-2662 has simple tastes. He likes a good old grilled cheese and tomato soup, a bean burrito, or a steaming bowl of ramen. With that, he's partial to a sugary soda, or sometimes lemonade. He often likes to tune into gaming streams on Twitch, especially obscure indie titles. Or if he's feeling like something a bit more familiar, Minecraft. But on this particular day, he has a visitor. SCP-507, the reluctant dimension hopper, has swung by with his own lunch to have a catch-up chat. A huge fan of meeting other friendly anomalies, especially those completely different from himself, SCP-507 often stops by Cthulhu's containment room whenever he happens to be in the same dimension. Hey, Squidward, how's it going? SCP-2662 hasn't seen the show that this particular nickname came from, but he enjoys being called a friendly name instead of some manner of esoteric title. During this visit, SCP-507 shares stories of his recent travels with SCP-2662, including his recent disturbing brush with a smiling man, and his much more delightful time in a dimension where he found himself on a beach, where the sand was made of popcorn and the sea was made of Coca-Cola. Any weird cults come by lately? He asks after finishing his story. Not in a few weeks. Tentacles crossed it stays that way. But you know my luck. Someone will probably be drawing arcane symbols on the walls and doing weird chants in no time. Bummer. 507 nodded sympathetically. Wanna play co-op for a bit? I haven't had time in forever. Sure. Even when it's a rare treat. It's always nice to spend time with a friend doing something you both love. Even if we can't relate much about SCP-2662's day-to-day life, we can at least relate to that. It doesn't have to be gaming either. It can be painting, baking, or even just watching a TV show you love. The activity doesn't matter nearly as much as the company, after all. 1.30 PM After about an hour of gaming with SCP-507, SCP-2662 gets an unwelcome interruption. Just when the two enter a new dungeon, ready to take on the bosses waiting there, right when SCP-2662 asks to be healed, SCP-507 disappears from his seat, popping over to wherever his anomalous dimension hopping ability dragged him to next. Oh, goodbye. He knows 507 can't hear him, but he wants to bid him farewell just the same. He turns to his computer and boots up a game he can play by himself. He only hopes his friend was sent somewhere safe and that he'll come back sometime soon. 2 p.m. At 2 o'clock, SCP-2662 gets yet another unwelcome interruption. A loud boom rocks the room as explosives detonate nearby, breaking a wall of the containment unit open. While the mobile task forces do their best to subdue the invaders responsible, they are all knocked out by a grenade filled with an unidentifiable form of sleeping gas. With no one to deter them, a group of strange civilians in red robes come pouring into SCP-2662's room. Oh great and powerful Lord of Darkness, we come to free you from this infernal prison! One man shouts, brandishing a candelabra filled with lit black candles. Oh, no thanks, I I'm good here. But we brought you an offering! Another man steps forward, tossing a bag of dried bats onto 2662's bed. Hey, oh man, I sleep there. Gross. Cthulhu groans. We have 13 more offerings, and then the sacrificial ritual can commence. You just need to come with us so it can begin. The day of great freedom, when you will unleash your thousand-year reign of madness upon the land. I'm not really into madness, I'm more into Overwatch. SCP-2662 backs away from the supplicants, even as they come at him with more and more grotesque offerings. Cow tongues, unidentifiable mushrooms. One woman tries to hand him a crying baby. He refuses each one, but they are persistent. As he's swatting away jars of pickled frogs, a woman begins drawing a circle around the room in what he hopes is red paint, but fears is something else entirely. Um, <clears throat> thank you for all these gifts. You have proven yourself as loyal followers. I'm going to stay here though to uh, spread the madness. From here, you, you, you can all go home. He tries to shoo them out, but they continue to press closer. Thankfully, his rescue finally shows up. 
Task Force Tau-9 swoops in at this point and begins knocking out and administering amnestics to all of the cultists. They may not be able to cure them of their mad devotion, but they can at least make sure the cult forgets the location of the containment unit. At least, for a little while. They're able to dispense with these particular intruders humanely, but they may need to use lethal force for the next ones. That's always a possibility. After the cultists have been removed from the site, some maintenance staff are called in to repair the damage to the wall where the explosives knocked it in. While they work, 2662 goes over his newspaper one more time, making sure he didn't miss anything. Attention to detail is an important skill to have, especially if one intends to get the most out of their everyday life. He finds a few editorials he neglected to read before, and enjoys finishing up the newspaper in its entirety. 4 p.m. After the task force returns to their stations and the maintenance crew has finished fixing the wall, SCP-2662 turns to one of his newest hobbies. He attempted to hide this pursuit from the Foundation at first, but they agreed to let him try it out as long as he followed some safety precautions. So now, at around 4 p.m. every day, SCP-2662 streams on his very own Twitch channel. He never uses identifying information and keeps his camera turned off the entire time, lest the internet sees his tentacled face, but he does talk to the few viewers in his chat via a microphone. What's up, it's Squidboy2662, back to play some games for you guys again. Hope you're all having a killer day and thanks for tuning in. Today I'm going to be checking out Apex Legends for the very first time. A lot of you recommended this game to me, so I'm stoked to check it out. As his small fan community watches, SCP-2662 tries out the popular MMORPG and plays his way through it for several hours. One person in the chat asks if he has ever heard of the, quote, Great Tentacled Beast of Legend, but he makes sure to block them before they give the rest of the chat any ideas. He doesn't want people to watch his streams because he's some famous elder god or something. He wants to be liked for who he is. 7 p.m. Every gamer needs to break for some fuel, and SCP-2662 is no exception. At around 7, he wraps up his stream, thanks all of his viewers and subscribers, and gets ready to have some dinner. He throws on another podcast, this time an actual play podcast following a tabletop gaming campaign, and digs into his last meal of the day. Like all of his other meals, it varies from day to day, but most of the time he goes with his favorite, pizza. A big cheese pizza delivered from a local pizza shop by a delivery boy who has received more than his fair share of amnestics, and can never remember why exactly this random unmarked building seems so familiar. Munching on his pizza and listening to tales of magic and mayhem acted out by a group of friends at a game table, SCP-2662 can't help but feel just a little melancholy. He's happy with what he has, of course, but he dreams of a normal life. The kind of life where he and his friends could play games together or record a podcast, where he could share this pizza with someone else. But he might not ever have that, and it's something that he has to accept. He can still choose to appreciate what he has, rather than mourn what he doesn't. After he's finished eating and the episode is finished, it's back to the normal grind at the computer. He turns on The Sims for a little while, constructing the kind of normal life he'd like to fantasize about sometimes. But then one of his Sims burns down the house while trying to make eggs, and he gives up on that particular endeavor to play some Minecraft. 11 p.m. Some nights, the excitement keeps SCP-2662 awake and playing his games until the wee hours of the morning. Tonight, however, he finds himself exhausted from an unexpectedly action-packed day, courtesy of those cultists. He powers down the game, turns on his final podcast of the day, a guided meditation to wind him down for sleep, and climbs into bed. Tomorrow he'll get up and do it all again, doing his best to carve out a little bit of peace in a strange, chaotic world. Maybe tomorrow he'll just be left alone, allowing to be himself instead of what everyone expects him to be. He'll just have to stick it out and see. That's the beauty of life, after all. Tomorrow is always a new day. Want to own an SCP of your own? Go to scpswag.com for premium, anomalous merchandise. There are places in the multiverse that human beings were never meant to find. Worlds populated with swarms of crawling spiders, isolated dimensional prisons where faceless corpses mimic the living, and realms bathed in the purest darkness where a glimmer of light may reveal more than what a visitor might ever want to see. These places serve to remind us that every one of us is, before any other essential quality of our collective experience, alone. Every human mind is an isolated incident, struggling to make sense of every environment, 
while hoping to find common ground with the other people in our lives. We strive to understand others and be understood, but sadly it is often the case that we must interact with fellow human beings whose motivations seem alien to us. All too frequently, we are surrounded by people we cannot relate to, in situations we have little control over, and even if we make attempts to articulate ourselves, there will always be an insurmountable gulf between the limits of our experience and others. As far as each of us knows, we are the only free-willed individuals in the cosmos, and even the nature of that free will is deeply in question. While many of us become overwhelmed by these bigger questions and are forced to confront our inherent loneliness, there is an instinct to turn to unfeeling things for answers. Surely the vast expanse of creation that made us must have done so for a reason. Most of who ask that question spend their entire lives waiting for confirmation of that reason. They reach out for something or somewhere that they are meant to be. It is only the vanishing rare few that find it, an unmistakable answer in an unspeakable place, a terrifying vista of madness that all but screams, you will never belong. SCP-507, the reluctant dimension hopper, has found himself in places like these more times than he is able to count. He has seen the spiders, the room of corpses that mimic human activity, and has peered through the darkness assisted by a flashlight, and seen only the smiling face of a humanoid monster. There are dozens more frightening and unsettling universes that SCP-507 has encountered, and all known instances have been archived in document SCP-507-3B. Any one of the innumerable horrors that this otherwise ordinary human male has endured would send a shiver down the spine of the best of us. But unfortunately, this is little comfort to SCP-507. Facing down the madness of the abyss and returning intact starts to become less triumphant when it is a weekly, sometimes daily, occurrence. The Dimension Hopper can barely have a moment of peace in this life, as his irregular shifts into different realities occur without any warning, and all the research that the Foundation has done on SCP-507 seems to indicate that there will never be an end to these trips into the infinite. But no end does not necessarily imply the lack of a beginning. The tragic existence of SCP-507 could not have started without a cause, and part of the Foundation's goal in containing SCP-507 is to discern an explanation for the humanoid signature unstable mode of interdimensional travel. So far, the experiments have raised one burning question after another, with SCP-507 himself having difficulty recounting some of the stranger aspects of the dimension he hops into, and in a grander sense, what it might all mean. But the Foundation has no choice but to listen intently to SCP-507 and take notes on everything he says in regards to his condition. After all, the phenomenon of leaping to other worlds primarily affect the Dimension Hopper himself, and can really only be understood through a thorough understanding of the subject. Over the course of many interviews with SCP-507, the research team has pieced together what they believe might be the definitive history of the reluctant Dimension Hopper from his native reality to the flux of ever-changing hellscapes that occupies his current days. While it is impossible to verify, due to the imperfect nature of memory and the countless traumas suffered by SCP-507, the Foundation believes that this record can be used as a case study for further investigation into the multiverse itself. On a less practical level, the interviews can help the Foundation to improve containment for SCP-507 and make sure that his existence is as lacking in unnecessary suffering as possible. We're going back to the beginning to the earliest dimensional hops that SCP-507 can remember in detail. Considering the persistent nature of SCP-507's anomalous capabilities, it was hardly surprising for the Foundation to learn that the humanoid did not have a conventional childhood. 507 has never made any mention of identifiable biological parents, nor of any grade school educational facility, public or private. In the absence of these markers of normalcy, SCP-507 describes spending an indeterminate amount of his formative years in a fantastical realm known as Liminora, though it has apparently been decades since SCP-507 has hopped into Liminora. 
he was able to describe the dimension in great detail. A grassy plain overrun with red, honeycomb standing stones that seemed to sing with thousands of beautiful voices as the wind blew through them. The skies of Luminora were colored a velvety bluish purple, which never got any dimmer than a commercial nightlight. There were shallow streams of spring water that seemed to run in all directions regardless of elevation. There were also dangers in Luminora. Flocks of swooping birds, which SCP-507 described as having the appearance of skinless vultures. These vultures would often attempt to capture SCP-507 and bring him to a location known as the Dawnwell. As one might expect, 507 was never actually apprehended by the creatures, but insists that these were more than ordinary birds of prey. Vultures don't hunt for live human children, being scavengers after all. It has also been made clear that 507 was the only human of any sort in Luminora. This has led the researchers to conclude that he most likely wasn't born in that reality, and had previously hopped there from a dimension of origin that remains inaccessible due to his lack of memories during infancy. The Dimension Hopper claims that his best friend, Finnecker, always protected him from these avian threats. Finnecker was another creature native to Liminora, who resembled an anomalous crustacean the size of a large dog covered in what SCP-507 believed to be a coat of tufted brown fur. When fending off the vultures, Finnecker carried a heavy cudgel in one of his claws. The blunt instrument was said to be carved from the same material as the musical standing stones. Additionally, 507 has remarked that the inside of Finnecker's shell was mostly hollow and could be used as a shelter and resting place for the young Dimension Hopper, as long as he had the continued friendship of the creature. Many researchers who have taken statements from SCP-507 regarding the menorah have reflexively come to view the unconfirmed dimension and 507's experiences therein as the product of a wild imagination made more vivid due to a traumatic upbringing. On the other hand, SCP-507 insists that Liminora is not a psychological coping mechanism and is, in fact, just as real as all of the other dimensions he has hopped into. It is difficult to dismiss his account entirely, as no matter how many times SCP-507 is asked about Liminora and how far apart the interviews are, the details of the account never seemed to deviate from what had previously been established. During his time in Liminora, which may have spanned more than a year, 507 has stated that he was the happiest that he had ever been. Whenever he wasn't avoiding the vultures of the Well of Dawn, 507 passed time by listening to the music from the Standing Stones, surfing the erratic currents of the shallow streams, and learning rudimentary carving techniques with Finnecker. In some ways, Liminora was a paradise for a child. There was no homework or chores, and whenever it was safe, he could play outside as much as he wanted. It wasn't until one terrible night that everything about his isolated existence changed for the worst. While falling asleep inside Finnecker's shell, SCP-507 experienced a random dimensional shift to a deep and forbidding forest. At first, he thought this new reality was a dream, as it was abnormally dark and misty, nothing like Liminora. Then, he saw them, the so-called Mammal Men. SCP-507 remembered their chattering teeth, long and orange, like beaver's teeth, as well as the leathery pale skin that covered their misshapen bodies. The Mammal Men roared and hissed, making unnatural noises as they chewed into the trees. The sound of it all was very distressing for young SCP-507, who began to flee from the strange humanoids into the nearby bushes. He cried out for Finnecker, hoping that his friend would arrive and protect him, but it didn't happen. And try as he might, it seemed as though he couldn't wake up from this nightmare. It wasn't a nightmare at all, in fact, but a true dimensional shift from which there could be no easy return. Terrified for reasons beyond his comprehension, the young dimensional hopper continued to cry out for his only friend. There was a sudden crack and a loud whoosh as one of the great trees of the forest came toppling down in his direction. SCP-507 braced himself for the inevitable impact, but it never came. 
He was in what appeared to be a city now, and it was the middle of the day. Crowds of human beings surrounded him, and the sounds of automobiles and phone calls drowned his mind in the cacophony. It was a total sensory overload compared to Liminora, and being exposed to it after having such a harrowing experience in the forest dimension caused SCP-507 to break down into tears. He continued to weep and call out for Finnecker, but his crustacean friend was several worlds away now. When the authorities eventually arrived, given a call about a lost child, SCP-507 was brought to the nearby police station. The officers tried to ask SCP-507 questions, presumably about where his parents were or where his home was, but 507 recalls being unable to understand the language they were speaking, and thus there was no hope of communication. The adults seemed equally frustrated and tried speaking to the child in a number of different languages. Eventually, when no parent or guardian appeared to claim the child, it was determined that SCP-507 would be placed in foster care. From there, SCP-507 was given to a family that soon became his legal guardians. He was homeschooled on many of the basic subjects of science and math, and learned the English language through constant tutoring. While his new parents and siblings were willing to entertain his stories of Liminora and Finnecker, they believed it was little more than the fantasy of an imaginary friend. Throughout the rest of his youth, SCP-507 experienced no unusual dimension hopping and began to live a relatively normal and unremarkable life. At a certain point, he even began to believe that Liminora never existed. None of the other children he knew had ever experienced something like it a fact that they would constantly remind him of in their ruthless teasing. Even so, SCP-507 entered his teen years as a shockingly normal individual given the circumstances. While the Foundation has never been able to verify the names and identities of his foster family members, mostly because SCP-507 has been reluctant to divulge any related information, his seeming loyalty to keeping the people who raised him anonymous is proof enough that this chapter of his life was not fabricated. According to SCP-507's testimony, the involuntary shifting began to reoccur not long after he had gone through puberty. The sudden disappearances worried his family, and many times they believed that he had attempted to run away from home. This also had an impact on his social and educational development, as maintaining both friendships and good grades in high school were difficult when he could disappear for days and weeks at a time. The vast majority of these dimensional leaps are uneventful beyond the strain they put on SCP-507's efforts at a normal life, but one in particular has left a lasting impact on 507. It was during a Halloween block party in his senior year. When SCP-507 shifted away during an attempt to refill his punch, he blinked in shock to find himself in Liminora once more. But it was not as he had left it. The sky was a deep shade of maroon and cracked like a glass surface. From there, these cracks spilled sand-like rain onto the now desolate plains and dried up rivers. The standing stones were mostly broken and there was no wind to conduct them into their song. The Teenage 507 wandered around this ruined Liminora in disbelief. The fantastical place he remembered had been real for his entire life, but now it was dead. If that wasn't traumatizing enough, nothing could prepare him for what awaited at the Well of Dawn. Near the strange pit of emanated sunlight was the rotted, sun-bleached shell of a massive crustacean, Finnecker. 507 barely had any time to take in the sight of his long-lost friend before he was returned to the roof of the Halloween party. That was the last time he ever saw the world of Liminora, but it was far, far from the most horrific sights that the multiverse would have to offer. Want to own an SCP of your own? Go to scpswag.com for premium anomalous merchandise. Uh, what about this one? One SCP researcher called to the other. You've got to be kidding. His colleague scoffed interpreting the suggestion as little more than a joke. That thing's a piece of junk. She tapped a knuckle against the glass case, catching the attention of the tiny figure inside. Who dares? exclaimed the tinny, monotone voice. Release me from this irksome confinement so that I may bring about your final undoing, vermin, for I am Doomba 2000, the ultimate bringer of destruction. Both researchers laughed at the small automaton inside the glass. They had come to SCP Item Gallery 27 in search of non-organic anomalies to gather for testing. 
but judging by their reactions, it seemed that SCP-1370 wasn't going to make the cut. The cobbled together robot was widely considered to be a harmless, clumsy little oddity, rather than any kind of threat. But that didn't stop SCP-1370 from challenging any and all things around it to a battle to the death. Battles it always lost. Ah, this thing is junk, the second researcher remarked, flicking her finger at the glass again in an attempt to startle the robot. It is not organic, though, the other pointed out, observing that SCP-1370 had been constructed out of various recycled parts. Its head was a defunct and non-operational voltmeter, soldered awkwardly onto a weak neck joint. Its arms were wrenches, and it had been configured in such a way that gave the robot a top-heavy, impractical design. Inorganic, yes, but worth our time? Definitely not. Come on, we'll find something else to test in SCP-914. As the pair of researchers turned their backs on SCP-1370, it began to squawk at them again through the speaker embedded in its chest. You dare walk away from me? You have incurred the wrath of Robolord the Destructor and will soon be reduced to atoms by my hand! The tiny junk robot charged towards the two Foundation personnel, only to slam front first into the glass of the display case it was kept contained in. The force of the impact, combined with SCP-1370's imbalanced design, caused it to topple over and land on its back, leaving a huge crack in the glass. Ah, great. One of the researchers sighed, rolling her eyes. We're gonna have to report that SCP-1370's damaged its case again. Come on, let's go and get someone to replace that glass. You think we should just leave it here unsupervised in a damaged case? The other asked. Look at the thing, it's hardly competent enough to escape, the fellow researcher replied, as the tiny robot struggled to get itself back upright. I'm sure it'll be fine for a few minutes. Little did the pair of researchers realize as they left item gallery 27 that SCP-1370 had been listening to their conversation, picking up on a few details. While the anomalous automaton often displayed a low level of intelligence and awareness of its surroundings, it was still self-aware. And on top of that, harbored a hatred for all things it believed to be living. Although it could be easily tricked, and lacked any kind of real fighting ability, but it had picked up on something the researchers had mentioned, an SCP-914, perhaps through its own limited intelligence or some kind of other anomalous awareness, the tiny robot detected this to mean another machine. And so, standing back up, it struck the glass of its display case again, shattering one side completely. It hopped down to the ground, tumbling over thanks to its lack of balance, only to eventually stand back up and start making its way through the facility. Being only a meter tall made it easy for SCP-1370, otherwise known as Pesterbot, to sneak through the corridors of the Foundation site undetected. It eventually arrived at a room housing a large mass of gears and gyros, a machine filled with clockwork components that seemed to pull the little robot further in as it drew closer and closer to what the researchers had spoken of. SCP-914, the Clockworks, a device that could be used to refine any object placed inside it. Depending on the setting, items could be transformed, destroyed, or vastly improved using the Clockworks. Rough setting disintegrated any test subject, while coarse dismantled it to its base components. One-to-one -one replaced any item with an almost identical copy. Then, the fine setting would cause SCP-914 to improve any item, and very fine could refine an object to an even greater degree, usually by granting it anomalous properties. Testing of all biological matter within SCP-914 was strictly prohibited, but Pesterbot, well, he was made of metal. Sneaking into the room where the clockworks was located, SCP-1370 immediately caught sight of another Foundation researcher, who had been busy overseeing tests using the very fine setting of SCP-914. Instantly, the agitated little robot made a beeline for the researcher, swiping at her ankles with its wrench hands. Die! Die! It shrieked. Cower before the might of my claws! None can stand before the relentless destruction brought forth by Shivatron, despoiler of mirth! referring to itself with one of its many elaborate self-appointed titles. Caught by surprise at the tiny robot, the researcher turned and screamed in surprise. Instinctively, she swung her leg back and brought it forward, delivering a swift kick to SCP-1370 that sent its metal body hurtling through the air right into the clockworks. Pesterbot landed inside the input booth, 
the enormous collection of clockwork components whirring and heaving as they sprung to life. The researcher hadn't even realized what was happening. She'd been addressing how much her foot hurt after kicking the small metal robot. By the time she looked up, SCP-914 had already fully activated with SCP-1370 inside. In horror, she sounded the alarm to summon security, with no idea what the very fine setting would do to improve Pesterbot. A team of guards filed into the room, drawing their weapons and training them on the output booth of the clockworks. While they normally would have nothing to fear from SCP-1370, given its inability to ever win in a fight that it started, even when fighting a potted plant that had been affixed with a speaker, the tiny robot had been bested. But the clockwork's refinement process meant that what would be stepping out of the machine wouldn't be the pesterbot the Foundation was familiar with. Sure enough, the heavy foot that came stomping down on the facility floor was a far cry from the flimsy metal limbs SCP-1370 had previously had. Out of the clockworks emerged a hulking robotic form, not just bigger and bulkier than the meter-tall, clumsy assembled Pesterbot, but a huge, sleek machine built for bear. It was more humanoid, but stood at nearly seven feet tall. The weight and balance issues that had plagued the previous design were seemingly gone, as despite its increased size, this new and improved model of SCP-1370 seemed to move fluidly with smooth electronic motions. The robot turned and assessed its surroundings, scanning the group of Foundation security that had amassed outside SCP-914, its first new targets. As the machine stepped towards them, the security commander gave the word, and the guards opened fire. A hail of gunfire rang out, deafening shots ringing in the security officer's ears as bullets spat out of their weapons towards the newly refined Pesterbot. By the time each of them had emptied their magazines and the smoke cleared, they realized to their terror that the robot was now bulletproof. You have engaged in an act of violence against Doom Master 1370, Master of All Doom. It announced in a new voice, one far deeper and more imposing than its previous tinny candor. Now it was a modulated electronic sound, far befitting its new look. Prepare to face consequences. Retaliating. With that, the robot leaped into battle with all the grace and ferocity of a wild cat. The nearest security guard barely had a chance to reload his weapon, raising his hands in a weak attempt at a block before the strike from a metallic fist knocked the wind out of him. Moving with balletic speed and precision, Pesterbot swiped and chopped at the guard, each hit connecting painfully with one of the man's vital pressure points, like it was a highly trained hand-to-hand -hand fighter. When the officer collapsed, unable to move save for letting out screams of excruciating pain, the robot turned to face its remaining targets. Freeze! One of the Foundation's security yelled, raising his pistol with shaking hands. Zipping forwards, SCP-1370 grabbed the gun and wrenched it from the man's fingers, tearing the weapon apart like it was made of cardboard. Ripping the man by his SCP Foundation uniform, it launched him directly upwards, sending his body crashing through the ceiling, leaving a human-shaped hole above. Chunks of building materials rained down on the robot, including wiring and internal lengths of cable that ran through the walls and ceiling that were now exposed. As the security team retreated, SCP-1370 curiously reached up and gripped one of the electric cables, wrenching it out of the ceiling to examine it closer, causing sparks to shower. Pesterbot's new, sleek metallic skin seemed to react to the metal in the wiring, drawing out the copper that channeled electricity throughout the Foundation facility. It was more than a force of magnetism. It was something else. Ideas. SCP-1370 was learning, adapting, and most frightening of all, coming up with new ways to complete its purpose. Marching up to the nearest wall, it pulled back a metal fist and sent it slamming through paintwork and plaster to draw out the metal running through the building. Outside in the corridor, the lights died. In fact, the entire facility lost its power and plunged into darkness until the backup emergency lights activated, filling the Foundation's corridors with low-level blood-red light. More security officers had mobilized outside of the clockwork's room, expecting at any moment that the refined version of the previously harmless Pesterbot would soon appear. Sure enough, it did, and the red lighting was soon added to by yet another hail of frightening gunfire. But now, 
It seemed SCP-1370 had learned how to shoot back. An arc of lightning zapped through the corridor, electrifying every guard it touched and reducing them to little more than a smoldering husk. A second one followed, striking one guard with a bolt of blue electricity that then leaped from his body to the officer standing next to him, who had been close enough to touch his fallen comrade, and who was, of course, wearing plenty of conductive metal. The wiring in the walls, the electricity, SCP-1370 had learned how to weaponize it, and that wasn't all. As the robot stepped out of the room, it had pulled various other metalwork from the fabric of the building around it into its form, adding to its body in new and gruesome ways. Its shoulders now had additional armor. Long poles of rebar now extended out of its robotic forearms to act as crude, rudimentary impaling weapons. It had gotten even taller, and all forged out of metal it harvested from its surroundings. SCP-1370 hadn't just been made a better fighter, it had been given something else by SCP-914. Intelligence. The capacity for it to learn and perpetually adapt itself. And it wouldn't stop. It would keep improving itself to enact its original purpose, to fight anything and everything around it. A slaughter ensued. Everything the SCP Foundation threw at this new version of the Pesterbot only gave it more weapons and more offensive capabilities to add to its growing arsenal. The rebar weapons in its arms were replaced with sleek, sharp blades. Even bullets fired at it seemed to be absorbed into its mass, allowing it to keep growing. SCP-1370 was unstoppable, obliterating everyone that came to desperately try to contain it. And as it bested every opponent, left them decimated and defeated, something new happened to the robot. It couldn't feel emotions, just like with any automaton. It lacked the level of human cognition and complexity to respond to things with feelings. But as it killed more and more Foundation staff left and right, annihilating everything in its path, SCP-1370 experienced something. Not an emotion, but whatever the closest robotic equivalent to pure, unbridled happiness was. Satisfaction of the machine, now able to complete the function it was originally built for, yet had failed at for so long. Getting bigger and bigger, adapting and adding more machines to itself, eventually SCP-1370 was a hulking behemoth. Cars and their combustion engines all became part of the robotic giant, every new piece of technology it encountered becoming a deadly weapon. And as Pesterbot started to tower over buildings, a huge-scale robotic threat, the Foundation had no choice. It was time to deploy another big bad bot to cut SCP-1370 back down to size. It was time to send in the Dragon Slayer. Now go check out what if SCP-096 was put inside SCP-914, where the Shy Guys were fined into, well you'll have to click and see. And SCP-914, what did you put in it? To see what happened when we opened up the clockworks to you, the fans.